Hello and welcome to the DVD commentary of In the Hands of the Gods. I'm Ben Turner, one of the directors. I'm Gabe Turner, the other director. Uh, I'm Ben Winston, one of the producers. And I'm Leo Perlman, producer. This, uh, this first shot you see here is taken in Dallas, actually, isn't it? Yeah, outside Pizza Hut Park uh, in Dallas. We actually talked about this shot um, a long, long time before we ever set off to make the film. Um, we shot it and didn't really know where it would fit in, and then uh, we left our editor one day and he said, I've got a great beginning for the film, and he'd slowed it down, and it just looked unbelievable, really, and we all kind of, we all tried to claim credit for it, but really it was, uh, it was Alistair's, our, uh, our editor, so great shout from him, and I think uh, the perfect way to start the film, really. Big thank you to Alistair for that. Um, this is actually Danny, uh, freestyling, opens the film with Danny. You can tell it's Danny from the uh, David Beckham hairstyle, shall we say? A little bit of mullet poking out of the back. A little bit of mullet, a little bit of mullet. And uh, we, we like the idea of opening the film with a bit of radio commentary, because obviously before the boys left, they also went on BBC London and Talk Sport, and um, it was a good way of starting the journey and, and defining what the subject was. It was funny, actually, because we had this and we had a TV interview to cut between, and we decided to choose this one in the end. And Mark Bright was in the TV one, TV. Mm. and then the premier came up to me and said, um, tell me I'm in the film, uh, tell me I'm in the film, so I can, you know. And I was like, uh, you didn't make the cut. No. And he wasn't too happy. Right, he didn't make the cut. But he's a great bloke. So a lot of this footage over here is, uh, is from the pilot that we first made when we were sort of trying to work out whether it was actually a good idea or not. And we, uh, we set the boys a challenge to busk for their supper in London. Um, we were maybe, well, we were th seeing how far beyond egg and chips they could get. <laughs> and, uh, and they ended up eating that night in the... Uh, where was it? Was it, it, was the Ritz? A, it was the Savoy. The Savoy. It was the Savoy. But in fact, of the, of the pilot, I think this was the one shot that everybody always sort of goes wild over. When me and Gabe were filming this game. Yeah, he actually, he actually does this twice out of three. People always ask, did he get that first time? He did get it first time, but he then stepped in front of the cameraman who had a bit of a panic <laughs> attack uh, and tried to explain to me that he hadn't got it. Danny then put the ball down, missed again, and then the third time curled it straight through, and that's the one you see there on, uh, on tape. I love Harry's pet foods there, <laughs> yeah. top left-hand corner. It's just Liverpool market. And the meat. And this is, uh, this is in Mexico from the middle of the trip. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Why, we put this in, we sort of were trying to make sort of like a dream-like sequence of it all, right? Yeah, that's it. A special, far-away place. And all credit to that shot should go to Matt Beecroft, our DOP, who chose that wall in Mexico and said the way the light was uh, coming off the back was so beautiful, I have to shoot here. And uh, he did, and it looks great because it's right up at the front of the film. And the other end of the spectrum is this is so beautiful in another way, the, the area in Hare Hills in Leeds where Sammy lives. Yeah. Not so beautiful to walk round no. at night. No, but it's got its own charm. I thought this scene, this always made me laugh with Woody when we, I think we all learnt a lot about Woody when, when we went to uh, watch him take that class and he was, he was, we've always sort of seen him as a bit of a, a bit of a laugh and then suddenly he was instructing these kids and, and what was that, what happened there? It was like sensibly. Sensibly, yeah. Yeah, he'd sort of talk to the kids and sort of go, can everyone behave sensibly? And we realised he might be a bit of a leader of this trip. Uh-huh. Mike is home outside Liverpool. Amazing. The, um, the, the interesting thing, actually, this film wasn't always called In the Hands of the Gods. It was originally, when we were uh, filming this, um, it was actually called In Search of Diego. But um, it got nearer and nearer the release, and we actually thought we'd prefer to change the name to In the Hands of the Gods because we thought that there was something a little bit more cinematic about it, and we were a bit worried that people would think this film was about Diego Maradona if it was called In Search of Diego. So we changed the name to In the Hands of the Gods with the play. With the play on the hand of God thing. But it was just a little bit more cinematic and talking about sort of destiny rather than just looking for Diego. <coughs> so wasn't this film on your shoulders, Ben? This is, yeah. This is, no, no, on Gabe's shoulders. With Gabe's shoulders. the cameraman on Gabe's shoulders panning up. And we went to shoot. Like we, we'd been up there before to that area of Leeds and we'd, kind of, we'd had a look at it because we, we knew Sammy by that stage and we went we thought oh wouldn't we be nice to film on that staircase and we went to film on the staircase but the stairs had been removed and it was just <laughs> it was just a slope it took us about 10 minutes to work out we were still in the same place and this is sammy's mum's house it's quite a sad scene this yeah quite a difficult thing to film because yeah of what happened obviously look at his stubble though look how look how clean his shave is there because he was living on a supermarket roof and he's just got such a clean line very Craig David. I think that once he let us film this, I think we realised that they really were going to just let us film everything. It was, I thought it was very brave and giving of him to let us come to his mum's house 
where he was going to try and get a goodbye out of her after not speaking to her for however long. Mm. Very good of him. Leo's not a talker, but you should see the smile on his face. Really lapping up. I'm just up. enjoying listening to you boys. Leo, what have you got to add right now? He's not a talker. That's all the boys with their girlfriends. It took us a long time to find this track or to agree on this track. <laughs> yeah, we argued about this for a while. Yeah. Had to keep the film. Are the contenders? DJ Shadow came close. DJ Shadow came close. Well, we wanted something British and exciting and kind of American and slightly punky and pretty long, pretty long list of what we wanted. I think it's a great track. The only problem is it has been used quite a lot yeah. before. I think that was just the main downfall of it. But we love the track as a track. I think it works in the piece. I also love that shot that we missed of Mikey walking next to that guy in his <laughs> in his Holland tracks, so just berating him, telling him he's got to give him some money. <laughs> Yeah. At this stage, Leo was being dragged off by the police, when you know? Making up <laughs> lies <laughs> and scandal to try and keep us in New York filming. No, that was at the airport. Well, you, you, at the I thought that was constantly through New York. <clears throat> no, no, at the airport there was an incident. How many runners with the police did you have in America, Len? A couple. A couple. I think more than a couple. Maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> Very popular figure in America. Me. <laughs> but not Diego. No, Diego definitely wasn't a popular figure in America. I think this was the boys were sort of getting used to busking on the streets and stuff. I think it was a bit weird for them at first because they were they they weren't that good at it, were they? When they first started, they sort of didn't really. Yeah, they they needed to get some of them. They needed to get the aspect of performance. I think now, like late, later on in the film, as as they sort of one at a time realised what was involved in getting money off people. People loved watching them, but it took them a what double round the world. That's an amazing trick. Really. Um, yeah, once they realised what was involved in actually like making that money, they obviously did a lot better. But they're working hard, but not always getting much. Mm. Yeah, they found it so easy in London when they did it to go to the Savoy. I think it was a bit of a shock when they got to New York. Yeah. Um, there was also always that thing about when people were filming. If, if we were filming them, I think people sort of thought, well, maybe they were actors and they didn't actually need a dollar. And there came that moment where you were sort of like, no, no, it doesn't matter, they're filming us. They're not paying us, we're not actors, we actually really do you need your, that dollar. And there's that sort of thing where if you see a film crew, you think, well, they must be actors, they must be rich. I'm not giving them $5 or whatever. And yeah. I think they needed to really persuade people that, although we were filming them, it was... Um, yeah. You actually filmed this bit, B, didn't you? Well, we almost didn't get this. No. We'd like, you have to, at some point in the day, have a break. And, uh, and we'd broken our crew and we just were standing by watching them and they'd left the camera up on the tripod. And Jeremy just sort of wandered over and started doing ridiculous freestyle. So <laughs> I thought I'd just turned it on and hit record. It wasn't a particularly, we even like carefully lined up shot, which is get it on as quickly as possible, but it worked out pretty well. This is ridiculous. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> That's Matt B. Cross hat that they remember. They stole <laughs> yeah. his hat and started using it. There's a lot of crew hats in this. They yeah. sort of emerge in, don't they, in different moments. Yeah. And there's Brooke in the background. Roof of the Rockefeller Center. Yeah. After the performance down in the bottom, they were allowed by Brooke, who they met there. Uh, she allowed them up onto the roof to have a little look over New York, which was totally incredible. It was beautiful up there. Was this the first night or the second night they arrived when they sort of sat here and realised... I think this was sort of this meeting where they realised how big the scale of what they had to do was. This was the first night. Thanks. <laughs> no worries. No, I'm glad. Just helping. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Len, yeah. First night, good. Okay. Driving the narrative, thanks. Yeah. But um, I think it was here that sort of Woody really emerges as the leader. The, like, Jeremy's just talking about how they need to spend lots of money to eat. Sammy doesn't really know what the clue, like, have a clue of what's going on. And, and, and Woody's the one who sort of just goes, actually, we've got to work here, you know, we've been lazy. And, and uh, starts getting them all in gear. And they just laugh at him here. He says, you know, we're going to get in trouble if we don't start working. And they all just laugh. They weren't laughing later on. <laughs> no, they weren't, no. Mind you, neither was he. Who? Woody. No, Woody wasn't laughing either. They burnt their bridges with Woody. <laughs> the thing about New York was we, we, because we wanted to get to grips with them and filming them and stuff, we agreed not to film them in any of the evenings, um, except for this one here, where they said they were going to sit down and talk about the trip. But most of the time we didn't film them in the evenings in New York and we were worried that we were missing loads of stuff. Um, but we were having a pretty good time as well. Uh, we went out 
I think three or four nights on the spin. You had a good time and, uh, in New York, didn't you? Yeah. And it Why was, did you have a good time in New York? It was much fun. <coughs> um, what kind of fun? We had a lot of good just, kosher steak. It was just it was just a good time. New York was a good time. It was uh, it was definitely one of those things where you realise you're making a film in the other end of the world and everything is looking rosy. So uh, mm. <coughs> yeah, I really enjoyed New York. And I think also at that time we thought it was going to be a bit easier than it was as well. I think I don't think we thought we were going to come into so much trouble. And then it snowed. Yeah, that was bizarre. We, 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 we were in Mo- it was in May. It was April or May. We it was were there. April. April. Yeah. That's what drives. Sorry, Leo. When was it, Leo? April. Thanks, Leo. Just here to keep you right. Yeah. Good. <laughs> detail. Detail, man, Leo. If it was just out of nowhere. It was bizarre. They were sort of on this road and 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 it's so snowing. Slightly bizarre. This is like, this is about a mile and a half outside of New York. It took us like three quarters of a day to get a mile and a half outside of New York <laughs> and then have a huge argument. <laughs> I think it was when they were like tired and stuff that their characters that we'd always thought about started coming out. You know, it's like we always, I think in New York everyone was just excited and then suddenly the, the characters mm. that we'd always thought would come out, as soon as they get a bit tired, haven't had that much sleep, they're getting lost, suddenly, you know, the characteristics yeah. are, are coming out more and more. For any aspiring documentary filmmakers out there, tired and hungry. Yeah. It helps get, you know, perform get that stuff out of your uh, subjects. This was the, the first of about four of these street arguments <laughs> as they got lost all the way down America. And and was, there's Mikey asleep and Button Men playing on the radio. This is actually Ben Turner here. This is your this is your band we put there. That was yeah, that was ten we, we needed we needed to change the track on the radio because it was expensive and my band is free. They so, are <laughs> indeed. Although they're available for they're weddings for, and permits for weddings and permits for yeah. sure. Okay. And children's birthday parties. Yeah, of course, Button Men. Button, Button Moon. Moon. They could do a theme party. Oh, yeah. Get in. This Travis Wemmick here is a great track for this. Mm-hmm. I think one yeah. thing people really love about the film is the soundtrack, and, and this is definitely one of, our, yeah. one of the great tracks in this film. We should give a shout out to James Hyman for James rinsing Hyman. it on the soundtrack. Indeed. James Hyman. On XFM. This was this was one of the few. There were two times that we had like the opportunity, the time to, to send a crew off to get nice shots, or to go ahead and like get the car driving down streets because we always wanted to do that, get lovely shots of them, big wide shots of them like driving down the highway. But mm. that was one of the only two occasions we had the chance to. I love this moment when he washes his mouth out with Sprite after brushing his teeth. <laughs> it sort of defined how much they were living rough. Yeah. Mikey causing trouble. There was just hours of this stuff. Do you remember when we got back, we just looked through hours of them in the car. Most of it, nothing happened. And every now and then, Mikey would do something stupid <laughs> and liven proceedings up. Mm. I didn't think Sammy was... I didn't think Mikey, sorry, was going to do anything but this throughout the whole trip. Yeah. And that was definitely <clears throat> my worry, which obviously we sort of discussed before the trip, was Mikey was there just to sort of do these silly things like open car doors and spray sprite cans around and all of that and I didn't necessarily think we'd have any real journey from him did at all. Did you predict that he was going to open car doors and spray yeah, sprite Yeah, I did. Cans yeah, I did. I really that's, predicted that's that. That's unbelievable. <laughs> that is amazing. You those two things. Well, I'm quite bright. Done. I'm quite bright. That's unbelievable. Um, and uh, I read palms. But it, it was, I just didn't think anything. I just, this was exactly what I thought would happen with Mikey and I sort of just thought, well, we're not really going to get anything from Mikey and obviously you guys thought there was going to be some big... Well, well Leo and Mike are quite close and, and Leo had always felt there was something there. Now then... Yeah, when you get um, to know Mike as well as I have done, you get under the skin. He's a very deep and interesting uh, boy. Man, man. Waiting to be discovered. Mm. This in Dallas was uh, was quite a big point for, for Mikey, though, because I, I remember when we, were, when we were stuck in Dallas for days, Dallas was a bit of a low point for us because it looked like they weren't going anywhere. They, this, they, here's a moment where they don't get a place to sleep for the, for the night. Um, and and my, I remember Mikey saying to me there, y- you guys don't care if we make it or not, do you? Mm. Well, we care, but we're not, you know, we still got to, you still got to film if you, if we don't make it. I think that was a, the beginning of an awakening for him that like it was it was in his hands, not the hands of the mm. God. And uh, and he had to step up to the plate, which he later did. This was great. This was difficult to cut down because this was about a 20-minute phone conversation, which Gabe filmed. Yeah, there's Gabe's shadow. You can see a shadow on the wall. It's the only time I appear in a film. (laughs) And uh, but but this was such a funny conversation. Do you remember? There was like at least three or four moments like this, which we had to choose 
between three Englands into Texas. How many states are there in America? Excuse my total ignorance. 52? No. There isn't. There is. Exactly, you got that right. Name them. We did that once. <laughs> Do you remember? Lee, quickly. Get us the first town quick. Actually, you got it right. There are 52 states in America. <laughs> the Denny's car park. We did it round the ball the other day. Come on, now. give us 10 quick states in America. Quickly. North Carolina, South Carolina. I'm watching the film, dude. Yeah. yeah I'm watching the film too. Dude. Yeah, we're watching the film. It is North Carolina, South Carolina, right? This was just a massive thing for them to do every night. Once they, they just thought, well, rather than spending money on hotels every night and also travel, let's just rent a car and then we can sleep in it for two weeks. And, and they literally just never left that car. They'd just drive and then sleep and then drive and sleep. And that's Chris in the background. You that see is, his head just come through. He was very sweet to the boys, let them use his office to... Uh, Internet. Make calls on the internet. And also, and Woody uses his phone there when he's on the phone. Yeah. Which everyone suddenly goes, Has he suddenly got a phone? And his map. That he yeah, he did use, let them use it. Why did he have a big atlas of the world? He was a traveller. <laughs> he was a traveller. But um, I think this was definitely, we've, we've sort of spoken about this before, but this was definitely, Dallas car park was the lowest moment of this trip. Yeah. I remember Leo saying, uh, turning to me one day and saying, I actually think that this trip will come to an end here and it won't go any further. And everyone in London was watching the rushes of what we'd shot so far and weren't really that impressed because nothing had happened and it had been about two weeks and the boys were still in this car park. How many nights were we in this, this car park for? Detail man, Leo? A week. A week, thanks. So we used to have an amazing cut here that we had to take out. Do you remember? There was a scene, actually, that got cut, and it did cut from Sammy drinking a close-up, a really beautiful close-up of Sammy, and it cut into the Dallas Stadium, but we had to take it out, and the, uh, the cut's not as good. So it's a shame you, you'll never see that, but it always upsets me to watch that, really. And this was one of the few things that they had organised from beforehand. They organised a performance in FC Dallas, which was a great possibility to make loads of money. Which they sort of half took. They made some money. Yeah. And they thought it was a lot of money, it's but actually, not as much. It was, yeah, I mean, this just wasn't as much of a success as they think it is. I mean, they're at the end of this scene counting money in that car park and thinking this was great. But if you think about how many thousands of people were in there, they've made $800. I mean, yeah. just because they wouldn't split up. They wouldn't split up and, um, and, and collect money separately. That was a real test of the don't get involved thing, because it was yeah. like, I just there were four stands and they were doing one of them and I remember at the end they were all of them collected by one exit. It's like it's just it split up. Just thousands of people streaming out of the stadium and all five of them standing together at one exit. It was it was but as long as they thought it was a success. Do you remember they tried to count the money on the pitch and got thrown off? Yeah. I don't think FC Dallas likes us very much anymore. No. And then it was back to the uh, reception of the car park in Dallas, yeah. where uh, we would sleep in the motel and they'd park up and sleep right outside our bedroom, but not be allowed in to use our toilets or sinks or anything, because obviously... <laughs> I remember saying to, my, like, say to Mikey, there must be five million bathrooms in Dallas. You're not allowed to use two of them. <laughs> yeah. No. The one question that we always do get asked is, is, obviously, you know, you did help them, or how much did you help them? And I think that's something that we've always sort of had to counter and sort of talk about. Yeah. Well, because yeah, I think they they get... Well, Woody especially gets a bit upset when that question's asked too much because it does sort of undermine the work that they put in. But I think that we, we as we always say, like, it wouldn't have been that good if they had to... If they're not actors. And, uh, and you know, it had to be real. Otherwise, it just would have been an ir irritating <laughs> journey. With well, we had arguments amongst ourselves. Jokes. Gabe and me were... Uh, we were a bit softer, weren't we, than these two? Yeah, a little bit. We wanted to help them a little bit more, but you guys sort of stood strong and even got us in line and said, no, whatever you do, don't let them use your, them toilets. Use your toilets. Ben Turner, one of the softest, sweetest boys you'll ever meet, suddenly became this <laughs> monster, went around the boys, wouldn't let them use toilets or bathrooms or anything and um, mm. became the hate figure. Uh, well, yeah, you know, sometimes you've got to become the hate figure, you know? Mm. Lee, this is the scene of our, our biggest argument, right? This is the scene of our biggest argument? Yeah, 45 minutes versus an hour and a half. We did have an argument about sleep. Why don't you tell the story tell of your argument? Let us in tell on this in joke of yours. We were getting a bus from uh, Dallas down to Mexico City, and Gabe was on an earlier bus with the um, with the the kids, and uh, sorry, freestylers, and uh, some of the crew. And I was getting a later bus, and we finished filming quite late. And Gabe had only 45 minutes to sleep. I had an hour and a half, and he was angry with me because I had the extra 45 minutes and wanted to talk before sleeping <laughs> and spoon. And say prayers. <laughs> what did you want to talk about? I don't know, just how the day had gone, how much fun we'd had. 
No, I think you were talking to me about Boal. We were talking about how we should get... Talking about what? <laughs> about American football. Oh, sorry. I was going back to spooning. <laughs> um, but it was fun spooning with Leo throughout the trip. Mm. Yes, it was. Much like the time in Newcastle when um, you took spooning to a new level. Dude, I was drunk. Do we go there? We shouldn't. OK. This is great. <laughs> this, is a, this is a nice scene. Yeah. It's a nice scene where Woody, uh, Woody asks Sammy about his... How old is Emma, his girlfriend at the time? She was... 29, 29. 30. I thought she was, like, 32, or was that just one of the she things that we 40. love to... She was in her late 40s. <laughs> she's I thought she was in her mid-50s. She's in mid-50s. Bless her, yeah. she's listening to this now. Children. But luckily she's in a retirement home where yeah. she listens to... She's no, always was... listening to it now. I mean, she's out of the picture now. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So be... All right, now, she... we're going to tell you something about this montage, because there's one guy that sneaks into about <laughs> yeah. three of the shots, some <laughs> random guy in Mexico. But here he is. Here he is. On the left. Left, left. Not the guy with the massive hat, but the little yeah. baseball cap. So there's the first time. He followed us around the whole night to try and get in. So there's his first appearance, and you'll see his second one a little bit later. Just staring right down the lens of the camera as well. Yeah, he loves it. He absolutely loved it. He was in this circle. Yeah. <laughs> if it had, it was, we hadn't have cut the rushes, he was in like 70% of the stuff. Yeah. We managed to get him out other than twice that first time there, and you'll see he appears again a little bit later. But funnily enough, Mexico just went completely wild for the boys. I mean, here in Acapulco, it was just incredible. They loved it. And they also got the whole Diego thing as well. Yeah. <laughs> I love the who was it? Something past no. Here he is, here he is. There he goes. There he goes. Does, is he in again? No, we cut him oh, out. We cut him he out. was in Lowe's, but we cut him out. I think we should have put him in. Mm -hmm. I think we should have taken him with us. I think on we should have done. We yeah. should have just popped up. We could have sold him. <laughs> <laughs> to make money along the way. <laughs> what would he have done? Rented him out, I don't know. As what? No, oh, the smiley face in your photo. Have trouble smiling. His here is Sammy uh, kissing lots of women. Women, yeah. And that was a great. That was actually a little. That that shot was a tightly bit before when we first arrived at the bus station in yeah. Mexico. And there were all those birds. They went on for hours. Anyway, when you say birds, you mean women or, or birds? No, as in like little uh, flappy, flappy ones. birds, right? Because they, yeah, there was just hundreds of them like flying past the flag. Jeremy's on a top bar. <laughs> 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 where they could. It was like, <laughs> well. This is one of the girls who, in the fight, in, the, in that scene where you see Sammy sort of um, kissing lots of women, he suddenly got a bit carried away with this girl here, and suddenly you. You started shooting like it was like Roger Moore documentaries, yeah, wasn't it? It was yeah. sort of shooting him on a long lens from far away, so they Roger wouldn't know we were shooting. Roger Moore documentaries. Wasn't what was his Roger name? Roger Moore, the old James Bond. What are you <laughs> talking about? Well, who they got? Michael Moore. No, no, no. Yeah. Yes. Got, no, the guy on ITV <coughs> used to bang down people's Sean doors. Connery. No, 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 not James Bond. <laughs> Mr. T. No, the guy on ITV who used to like investigate. Hey, Le will Les you stop Dennis. it? No, not Les Dennis. <laughs> not Bernie Mac. The guy. Gadget? The guy who used to get Roger. Moving on. We're who now in the, the floating gardens in uh, Acapulco. No, not in Acapulco. Mexico City. Mexico, Mexico City. City. This scene, actually, we used for all the colour tests, uh, and it was the most amount of fun, actually, in the edit, because we graded this uh, and really lifted the colours to make them as bright as possible to show how beautiful it was there. This was a, a, a moment that sort of, talk, sort of took us all a bit by surprise oh, yeah. here. With Jeremy. Jeremy suddenly sort of saying, you know, I care oh, about great. you, I love you. Oh, this was great. I remember seeing that thinking, fantastic. And he sort of says, you're all, you're all not saved. And we're like, what do you mean? And Mike is like, what? What do you mean saved? But I mean, this, was, this was fantastic because the boys really respect, like, respected him. I'm, when we got back to the cut, um, I think people were expecting the boys to sort of belittle Jeremy here. Um, and when I say people, I mean like you know execs and so on, Gary. Um, but uh, but it worked really, it worked really nicely. I thought um, the boys were really respectful, and it kind of showed that they that they sort of showed Jeremy uh, respect for the third time. The first time I ever met Jeremy was at Nando's in the O2 Centre. He told me I wasn't saved. You're not. Maybe not. The guy on the left, I always thought, looks quite like Ben Kingsley's character in Sexy Beast. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gone now, but if you get to see it again. And this was a very problematic caption because we did, couldn't really fit it in. Um, this was a subliminal Diego moment in that yeah. fat kid's T-shirt. Sorry. Overweight. Yeah. Whatever. Well, and we, they got they get given one ticket. What a shot, I, got given, I got given one, one ticket, actually. By, What's this? By a random person outside the Azteca, I got given one ticket. What, to go to a game? To go in the game that was going on. And I, well, I gave it up to the boys and they gave it to Woody. Um, 
and then held it against him later on that he was the one who gone in there. But I held it against him too because that was one of two or three football grounds that I got to stand outside and not go in. The Bombonero, I stood outside for a whole match because I couldn't take the camera in. But we'll get to that later. We will, we will. This is Woody doing his business. I think Woody, when the others are all enjoying themselves, which Woody was as well here because Acapulco was definitely one of the highlights, which we'll talk about but uh, I think Woody throughout this is all still about making money counting money arranging there he's negotiating with that guy saying listen a thousand you know hundred dollars to do the show and while the others were enjoying the trip and enjoying being abroad he was just l determined all the way through to make it and I think I think that definitely shows through I think it's post Acapulco that the other boys wake up a little bit like actually this is something we really want to do I agree. Is the, the, uh, the only thing you don't love see, a shot of two naked women there the only in thing beds. you don't see here are the midgets firemen um, and rollerbladers, which which have been cut from this, that is actually true. There were midgets, firemen, people well, in on Acapulco. Yeah, in Acapulco, that me and Leo encountered, uh, but didn't make the cut. Just a little plug: if you're ever in Acapulco, go to Club Tarbas, midgets, tequila, firemen, rollerblades, rollerblades, weird. and thrones that you can sit on at the top. You know, like the and, top and level. like security dressed up as policemen and truncheons and. Weird. That wasn't where this was filmed, though. No, no this was all in Acapulco. It was no. just around the corner from this. This was, I mean, Acapulco was crackers. I got propositioned by a group of 12-year-old girls who thought that I could help them be models. <laughs> and then they did you, helped did me you move... help them? Well, they helped me move some stuff up to my bedroom. And oh, then asked, oh, 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 no, 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 12-year-old girls up to a hotel yeah, bedroom. Yeah, yeah. We need to handle this carefully. That I don't want you guys what? incriminating me for things I didn't do. They asked if they could stay in my room until oh, I got back. Oh, mate. You, come on, I told they them they just you could stay in your room. I told them no. They just helped you move stuff. Why have you kept this until now? Because I knew you guys would react like this. Because it's weird. So you've, so you've, you've saved it for the DVD <laughs> forum. Yeah. yeah I, so we, we can all look him back. I might have taken my Woody's time still counting money, still working hard, even after a drunken night out. Yeah. Crossfade. I hate Crossfade. that. Sorry. I don't love yeah, the crossfade. No, it's, it's okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. We it's don't okay. know why I have to love the crossfade. to Martin Scorsese. And Woody getting the bad news. And there's Woody working out how to process the bad news. We were very, this was like an amazing day's shooting. This was a it? bizarre, this was, was the most tumultuous day of our shoot. After like two weeks or two and a half weeks of not enough happening, then everything that was supposed to all happened in one day. This is actually really uncomfortable because Woody's crying and there's about seven people <laughs> sat watching him. And uh, I, I didn't really enjoy that too much, to be honest. Mm. I think this is definitely the day the film takes off because right. you know everything up until this point has been a setup. It's been showing their characters. Mike is sort of up to this point a bit of a Wally. Woody's the leader. Sammy's sort of a bit misunderstood. I just want you to know you, you two in succession now have used the word crackers and Wally. <laughs> yes, yeah, I just want you to know that. I know they said we can't swear, but this is outrageous. We're going to be soft as if we start using crackers and Wally. Okay, fair. I don't want to be a part of that. I'm sorry. Um, I think the question I always get asked about this is where's Sammy in this scene. Sammy. Where was Sammy in this scene when Woody breaks them? He, where was he then? Sammy moment? was on the beach with another girl. He was on yeah. the beach with another girl, wasn't he? Yeah, Sammy so they the entire fine. trip cheating on Emma. <laughs> <laughs> and then getting upset about it. Yeah, and asking us not to put it in the film. Yeah. He was upset for the ten hours in between each different girl. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a bit weird that he obviously wasn't there. And then so Woody has to break the news to him slightly separately. And he immediately goes, oh, well, I'll give my ticket away then. I don't want to go. I want to stay in Agapulco because I've just met the love of my life. He did actually say that day that he wanted to stay in Agapulco for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. Live on the beach. Yeah. yeah it's hard, though. But the boys there, they were like, like rock stars in Agapulco. I can imagine wanting to stay there if it was me. Yeah, he didn't quite realise that once we'd left with the cameras, that wouldn't be the case. He'd just be <laughs> another person sleeping on the beach. <laughs> That is probably true. I think Woody here is sort of campaigning in a way because they're obviously they've, they've realised they've only got enough money for two flights, and then Woody sort of going round everyone sort of going. I think like to Sammy and to Mikey, sort of just going. Well, I sort of think I felt he was campaigning to say, listen, I'm the only one who's actually worked hard here so far, and I think I should be given the ticket. And, he had a fair um, point. He did have a fair point. I think he's waiting for that in that beach scene that, for them to say that, and it, and it sort of doesn't happen. Well, here's Sammy doing doing the promising. But this was an amazing day for Sammy because he did go from you, you know, in the sense here, you know, being nice and giving and trying to uh, trying to do the right thing in one way to realizing that actually he is good enough to, I mean, good enough as in good enough at anything, but good enough as a person or important enough to maybe try and do it himself, maybe try and you know take his own his own mission to its conclusion and make it come true. I mean, it, after he spoke to his mum during the day. Well, this was the day he realized that. That how important this trip was to him. How much it would mm. mean to me to actually meet But also that somehow it was kind of, that it was okay for him to want to achieve something, you yeah. know, and that perhaps he could do it, and, you know, it's a big, big day for him. It's funny, actually, with this sequence, we agonised for a long time because we really wanted to put in 
time and a sense of time because they spent a long time deliberating what they were going to do and we wanted to put in various shots that showed how much time they actually took to make the decision. Mm, the long day. That's right. This was also, this interview with Woody was quite a... Um, we discussed that a lot because I think one of the things that we didn't really want to go on about really, which the film never really touches upon, is why Diego. So in earlier cuts we had sort of footage of him scoring or commentary of him scoring and then as the film sort of progressed we realised that it didn't actually matter that it was about Diego really at all. They could have been doing ballet across the world looking for Desmond Tutu. It really was a bit relevant. I think Personally that... I probably wouldn't have been there if they were doing ballet across Maybe. the world Desmond Tutu. You love ballet and Desmond Tutu. I, I do, know what you're but I just don't off think of. necessarily that I would that have, you would have done that. But I think that it was it was one of those that was one of the moments where Woody it's one of the only moments where Woody says why he loves Diego on that beach and he sort of says, you know, I realised at this point when I thought it could come to an end how much he means to me. And talks about his video and I think that's quite an important moment because it sets up this next scene where Woody sort of doesn't um, doesn't uh, get the ticket at first. Well, that was just absolutely, like, petrifying for us because it could have gone any way around the table. We didn't know who was going to end up carrying on, who was going to stay. And we certainly felt there were certain combinations that would work better than others and certain people who would, like, who, you know, would do a better job if they were so had, tense around this table. Away. And there was, like, there was the added layer. We, when we were cutting it, there was always, have we, like, conveyed the tension of the day properly on film, but for us there was an extra layer of tension. It wasn't just whether who would go and who would stay, it was whether we had a film, whether it would work out. Mm. I don't know. think we could ever get the tension that was actually felt from us on that scene. Oh. It was uh, unbelievable, wasn't it? Well, because everything we'd worked towards kind of felt like it was in the balance at that point. And the truth is, if they'd managed, if they'd, if, they'd, if Jeremy and Danny had made, been able to convince them that they shouldn't take the two tickets, then genuinely they wouldn't have gone any further, I don't think. Yeah. I don't think Danny wanted to stay together. I thought it was just Jeremy, wasn't it? No, Danny didn't. No, Danny at the point well. during the day, all of them but Woody yeah. wanted to stay. And if they managed to agree upon that, then I don't think we would have got any further. The weird thing as well about this was, you've got to remember from our point of view, we didn't know who was going to be picked with who. So once they decided they were picking out, um, we were trying to work out how the film would work with all of these different... Um, possibilities of who would be with who or this one there, that one there and it's really difficult because you're, you're trying to work out dynamically which, is, which, which would be the best together, um, who would argue a lot, who would you know, sort of create more drama for you and, and because you're completely powerless you're sort of stood there and as, as much worried about you know, who's going to go, who's going to stay because you know you like the boys and you hope they all achieve and do well but also you know who's going to work for the film, you know, what's going to be good what's going to be bad drama and it was a really really tough day uh, that day, and I remember uh, spending a lot of time agonising really about how we were going to deal with the whole thing. Technically as well as creatively, of course, because we yeah. as a four had to split up and we had quite a tight crew of 10, 11 people. And, uh, and obviously if the boys were splitting up and going across the world, then we had to too, and we had to work out which was the best way of doing it. I think the two names that get drawn out of the hat, Danny and Sammy, were... I think w wouldn't have necessarily been such a successful combination going abroad. The dynamics of the characters. That was as bad a combination as anything. Yeah. So in a way, the fact that Danny gives a ticket to Woody made it slightly more exciting because at that point, Danny and Danny and Woody, we were splitting up those two because they were best mates. Woody and Sammy hated each other, so that was quite nice. They were going off together. But I also think at that time, Danny's fantastic freestyle now. But at the time, it was probably him and Sammy who were slightly weaker than the other five. I don't think they mind me saying that. So I think there was a worry that they were going to go to Guatemala and Brazil and be without potentially the stronger of the, the strongest of the freestylers. It really, really was <coughs> very, very dramatic at this point. I also, mean, stood DeWolf's there, hat. Can we have sorry. a moment for DeWolf's hat here? Yeah. This is our runner, Russ DeWolf. I think we'll come back to you later and tell some of the misdemeanours that Russ got up to on the trip. But uh, this was drawn out of his John Deere hat. Danny and Sammy going as well wasn't just the lack of freestyle. It was also the fact that they hadn't got the trip and what was required by this point. Like, they just hadn't got it, and I don't think they would have had the drive to get any further. It needed someone like Woody or Mikey, potentially, to have gone with. <laughs> this is so tense, even just watching it. Now look at Jeremy's face. Yeah. He just really didn't want to... He really wanted to stay together, and he just felt it was totally wrong that they were going apart. But there was also the added, you know, the added layer of... I think, you know, they called up... They reported back to their parents and said what was going on. And if you're parents and you hear your son saying, you know, I'm hungry and I'm tired and you get very concerned and some of that tension then came into it as well that like 
Mm. The, you know, it was about to be the end of the world. It really felt like it was like the end of the world had happened right there. Mm. You can see there was quite a bit of animosity towards Sammy at this point um, yeah. during the trip, and not one of the boys actually got up and patted him on the back or anything for coming out of the hat there. I don't know if you noticed, but they all get up and walk off. And I've always sort of felt like... It's a little bit out of order. Yeah, and then mm. we, and then it all kicked off just outside the bar. You, you get the second half of it, but we missed the beginning of like Danny saying, "Here, would you have my ticket?" Because it just happened immediately. They yeah. walked off, gave the ticket, and we were like, one camera was running after yeah. one, the other stayed on Sammy. We were chasing them really hard at this point. I mean, it, it was from here onwards. If the camera, if the crew thought they'd worked hard up till now, they were about to, you know, get a shot. Because <laughs> when we split up, then there was only one camera, and you couldn't relay them. You couldn't like. It was, it was, it was just shooting twenty four seven. It was really, it was really hardcore. We'll come back to this because we can show you the point at which we broke our crew. Mm. Um, it was hard, man. Funnily enough, Danny always said, actually, in the run-up to this day, that if it did come to this, he would give his ticket to Woody. And uh, he stayed true to his word. Mm. And I don't think Woody expected him to, to be honest with you. I think Woody was quite shocked. I think it was impressive from Danny to do that, definitely. I agree with you. I think this is the defining moment of his trip. And look at that shot with, with the wings, the angel wings. wings. I mean, you know. One of our friends brilliant. said, why would you pay so much for a tattoo that you can't see? So that we can film it from yeah. down the road and look great. And look I, think this was, I think it's a turning point for Sammy here. I think this is one of the most moving moments where he's crying and he said, you know... So, you know, my mum knows who Maradona is, and I think this is the first moment we actually see him opening up. Up until this point, he's been this aggressive brute. Mm. And now we actually sort of feel a little bit of sympathy from him. You know, he's had this call from his parole officer, and he's now sort of really opening up more. And, and the speech that he makes in this room is my favourite moment of the film, because I just think, you just couldn't write this. This is just an amazing moment. And this room was just full of tension and tears and... Upset this and Sammy just walks time, in. This was the only time in the whole film where they prevent, like, tried to prevent us from filming. Mm. They shut the door and we had to break it down to get in to film this. Well, no, they eventually they did eventually open it, but there was definitely some uh, mm. some uh, tension there. So did you break down the door or did they open it? No, they opened it. Um, oh, we threatened to break it. <laughs> there were lots of threats of breaking. <laughs> but um, it is an amazing scene. And, and Sammy, I think, is just fantastic in what he says. And I think he also puts it all into context. You know, he's saying they are being selfish because they're... They have left him as the outsider in a way. Yeah. But I think, to be fair to the boys as well, they responded pretty well to this little speech of Sammy. Yeah. Sammy. Look, look at Mike, he got yeah, trapped in front of the camera. It was such a tiny room. <laughs> there was one, and Mikey came in to get some, I don't know, pretzels or something, and got trapped in front of the camera. Look how uncomfortable he looked. <laughs> That's what Woody did whenever he was upset or in a bad mood. He would literally just put on his iPod and just not want to speak to anybody and just listen to music. Did that a couple of times with you? <laughs> he did that a couple of times with me when we had a few Barneys, but... Uh, and I still don't know what Get Your Straps Out is. No, here we go, here we go. If anyone knows what he's actually saying here... Let's talk it over, don't get your fists out. You get me? Don't talk about getting your straps and getting all your boys out and just What? I mean, I know I'm not the streetest of people, but that... Yeah, that's another language. <laughs> it's another language. And then this bit, sort of moment where Jeremy also, he didn't want to split up, he takes himself out of this and, and we just hear him sort of playing the trumpet. He was a very, very talented trumpeter. trumpeter and pianist. Pianist, he can draw well. He can draw well, he's a very multi-talented boy. And now I've lost my girlfriend, because I know I'm going to be a man about it and tell her. And this is also obviously, I mean, when we talk about, I mean, we don't really talk about Emma that much, who is his girlfriend in the film, but he literally was a father to this eight-year-old boy and going out with this 29, 30-year-old woman, which was a mad situation for a 17, 18-year-old boy to be in, especially one like Sammy. So I think that was quite a defining moment where he also says, I'm leaving that life because I'm leaving Emma because I'm telling her what I've done. I think this is, this is such a, like a jazz shot. You know, you see those mm. kind of like old photos of jazz trumpeters. It just looks really... It's um, just Diego. Diego Rodriguez, rather, D.O.P. This tune he's playing is The Lord Is My Saviour. Just a little bit of information for you. Nice hymn. Nice, great hymn. It's a great hymn. And it's also quite apt for this point. So any Christians who know what he's playing, it actually works for this moment, because the Lord will be his saviour on this trip. A little shout-out for all you Christians out there. We didn't earn enough, and we spent too much. I think this is where Jeremy sort of finally realises that actually all the stuff he was saying in New York about we've got to make sure that we have enough fluids on board and we eat and all of that actually maybe wasn't true because he maybe should have... They all should have ate less and drunk less and then they wouldn't be splitting up. And I think that's the moment he realises it, which shapes now the fact that he works... Him and Danny work really hard from now on in, really. 
Well, he, he was always so optimistic. Do you remember when we were so we, optimistic? Like, when we did the thingy in London, it was like, how much money do you think we'll make? Oh, about five thousand yeah. pounds. Five thousand pounds. He says, I reckon we're going to make enough money to fly to Argentina within about an hour, and then the rest of the day we'll tour New York. All, the, all this, all this was shot by a cameraman without any of the four of us there. All these, the next sort of um, where were we? Half, half a minute of them saying goodbye because we were all saying goodbye to each other. That's yeah. right. How unprofessional. So we weren't actually filming this. We were nowhere near this. So the first time I ever saw this was on the rushes and not over the cameraman's shoulder. Yeah. Well, because we had monitors which broke. <laughs> Day one. Day yeah. one. And thanks we were told much. by the hire company that that was our fault. Yeah, thanks PC for that. It's grateful. I actually really like this track. This was um, a busker who was in Acapulco, and we tried to use busker's music quite a lot throughout the film. There's a bit on floating gardens where we use those guys on a xylophone, is it? Is that what you call it? And also the, um, the dude in Hollywood Boulevard playing on his guitar. I think we like the idea that it reflected what they were doing and that they were also busking. But we listened to this so much. You've been so gay was the lyrics there. We used to make up words for these lyrics. I think we called it the Carlos Tevez song. If you listen to it, you can definitely hear him saying, Carlos Tevez, you've been so gay. Yeah. Um, and this is a great emergency gay. There we go. This is a great slate that you were talking about. Um, that slate that we shot there, um, Matt Beecroft would set up for his slates for hours. I mean, mm. he put so much into them because uh, we always wanted to punctuate the piece with these really beautiful shots. And he actually thought that one wasn't balanced right. <laughs> And I remember saying to him, mate, it looks great. He's like, no, mm. you know, he wanted to spend another two hours making it absolutely <laughs> we were perfect. Just... <laughs> we were really in a rush. I was like, Matt, that's absolutely brilliant. And it, I think it really does look nice. I make an appearance here. Even though he thinks it's not ready. You do. I'm actually in this film here. You've got to watch very closely. You get to see my legs and my sweatband. Are you ready for me to walk across the phone? Gabe, you noticed this, didn't you? I never did. I did, because I, 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 I recognise your legs. Here we go, there we go. Your those legs, sweatband legs. and midriff. Yeah, thanks. Like that's no one it. else's. <laughs> I don't know why I walked in front of the camera. It's very unprofessional. I think this is supposed to sort of contradict with the scene that was before with the montage in Acapulco where they're loving it and the girls are screaming and they're smiling and posing photos and women sort of scantily clad in their bedrooms. But uh, now they're sort of really not enjoying it and look quite empty without their friends, not even smiling, posing for photos, sweating. And I think that sort of defined how actually they realised this was now time to graft and count money and get back to California, because that's where they felt they could make the most money. This is actually your favourite part of the film, no, Len? This is my favourite part of the Why film. Why is it your favourite part? I don't know, this montage is really nice. I was devastated when I came into the edit street one day and you guys had cut it out. <laughs> but I didn't know who to blame, you guys, the editor, I wasn't sure. But thankfully it went back in. Thankfully. With this great shot. Because it is, it is quality, this bit. And it's got the woolly mammoth in it. Got the Explain who the woolly mammoth well, is. Well, the the guy who's playing the song. This is the other occasion when we had uh, like a morning to go off and just shoot nice stuff. Look, there he is. So I can just say, Gabe was scared of clowns and didn't want that shot. Yeah, in he for didn't that like reason. clowns because you're Actually funny about afraid clowns. Of clowns. Yeah, I was attacked mm. by the banging clown at an early age oh, and yes. I never recovered. This oh, also, though, this also was a, this also was a very tense moment. This guy here owed them some money and it was the money that they needed to get out of Acapulco. Mm. And they and they, he like, almost didn't turn up to give it to them. And uh, the way he did in the end, it was one of those things that we you can't get all the storylines into the film. So in the end, it's like a kind of a practical thing. But that night was very tense. This is my favourite part of the film. I know that sounds a bit morbid, but um, this was actually the time for me where the boys uh, really took over the trip. Mike actually came up to me and said, will you interview me because really, I really want to say something. I feel like I need to talk about something. And I suppose for a director, that's the best possible way of, of the whole thing working because you know suddenly you're not putting pressure on them to talk and to get stuff out of them and they're just coming up to you saying you know i just i feel like i want to talk and uh yeah this interview for me uh, gives me the most pleasure because this i think is where mike suddenly realizes what this journey is all about and slips into a new gear uh, and really drives the whole film forward and it's got good <laughs> I almost choked. And it's got good cutaways. You've got a real thing about cutaways, haven't you, Gabe? I don't like cutaways, personally. Well, they're these ones. These, these, ones, ones, these ones do work. This was the same beach that Mikey the day before, although this is quite a moving moment, so to ruin it with a very unmoving moment. But this is the same beach that the night before Mikey got arrested on yeah. by the police in Acapulco for um, being caught with a lady on the beach. Yeah, that's quite moving for some, probably moving for her. <laughs> yeah, it was. So was, suddenly... That was moving for me. I got oh, yeah, tell, tell the story about the police here. Mikey came back to the hotel that night. Danny and Jeremy had fallen asleep in the corridor. They were so tired. It was a marble corridor. Um, and we were shooting them then. He was in a blind panic, and we didn't know why he was in a blind panic. It turned out that he had been caught on the beach by the Mexican police with a young lady 
there was a uh, an issue over what exactly they were doing or what exactly they were trying to do. But the police were certainly trying to extort some money from him, and he didn't really know what to do. And we followed him down there um, and filmed him doing whatever he had to do. In the end, it didn't turn out that great because the police chased us off with the camera, um, and I found myself put, putting one part of the tape in the tape in one plant pot or something else in another, and running back to the hotel and giving it actually to Justin, the sound man, who uh, who ran off with the tape to another part so they couldn't get it back. And so we had the footage, but it didn't actually end up going in, but it was quite a hairy experience. So now we've all split up. Me and Gabe have gone off and uh, are sleeping on the beach in Boca del Cielo, and Leo and Ben have gone off mm -hmm. to... Where, you went, where did you go first, L.A. or Vegas? L.A. We were on our way back up to L.A., not back up to L.A. And this is sort of the, the, the night, really, where Woody and Sammy finally bond. They had been at each other's throats the entire time, and even on the bus, on the journeys, they'd be sort of not even wanting to sit next to each other. And it was in, it was in this sort of night where they wake up and sort of bath together. And so This was ridiculously early in the morning. It was like we 4.30. Were up about 4.30, and we were filming this. The boys were fast asleep, uh, and we, I couldn't get back to sleep after we shot the sun rise. Because it was, was bright. <laughs> yeah, and I was very, very put out. I was absolutely It was bright exhausted. and we didn't have a place. This uh, is a great moment, though, isn't yeah, it? Sorry to cut across you, mate, but this is like the moment where it's like their bond. tension is broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we filmed this We filmed this the morning we left, um, and by that stage they were fully sort of mates. They put all their stuff behind them, and as you say, like, they forced their friendship. I love bit. that snog here on the right-hand side. <laughs> it's also oh, something quite homoerotic about their relationship from this point on in the film. I what, felt. with Sammy and, yeah, yeah. Sammy and Woody? When you came back with the rushes, I was... A little bit worried at first, but it works nicely. It does. It does definitely work nicely. I think the other interesting thing about this is that up until this point, up until Acapulco, Mexico, if you like, Woody had been the leader. And it was Woody telling the other boys what they should be doing and you know where they should be sleeping and how they were going to raise money. And it was, in a way, here um, that Sammy became a lot more confident because this was more his territory, sort of the Guatemala areas and Mexico and Brazil. He was the one who felt much more confident around these people. He's, uh, and, and Woody was a little bit unsure of himself in these areas. It was it was so hot on that bus. <laughs> Sorry, I was just remembering how hot it was that the sound man was dripping sweat on my knee and there was no room, so I was pretty much sitting underneath him and there was sweat just dripping on my knee. It was horrible. This is great, isn't it? This it's also Sammy coming now. It's like Sammy's developing into a cat. He sort of just doesn't care that no one understands a thing of what I'm saying. Yeah. This was literally in the middle of nowhere. Middle I of mean, nowhere. I can't tell you how remote this place was. And we suddenly, pulled over just for a wee, didn't we? Yeah, it was suddenly, with, within seconds, there was just loads of people there. And, and the boys, uh, Sammy was just captivating. I mean, he was just, he was amazing here. He really was. I think it was just he was away from the other boys and he was in a, in a sort of foreign place and he always said this reminded him of where he grew up and he was just a lot more comfortable um, not in the Western world and, and suddenly he just becomes this amazing character and Woody's sort of a little bit unsure of himself and a bit worried and Sammy's just kissing women and... I remember everyone got a little bit angry with me here because we weren't supposed to be filming, do you remember? And uh, once the crowd came, it was like, right, we've got to shoot and we've been shooting for hours and hours and hours mm. and uh, the crew were not too happy. We made them roll for about an hour here, but um, <laughs> it definitely paid off in the end because of the 180 hours of footage. And of course, they met they this, made it in. and they met this kid to the right there, just the boy who's just out of frame, um, and he was the one who said, "Come and uh, come and sleep in our mud hut tonight." Nelson. Nelson. That's, how do you remember that? Nelson. His name was Nelson. I got to say, I think this is one of the most integral scenes in the film. Oh, this scene is something they them kind of because this scene is something that we had a lot of arguments about. It was in indeed the, in, in the edit because. About a month long argument. About a month long, and eventually just about, we all agree that it's important. Just about whether it's whether it is necessary or not for the uh, for you know and how it. You see, the, the, the trouble always was how what do you put in, and what do you leave out in order to like accurately reflect what happened on the trip? Because if you put in the scene where it looks like they're not doing anything, then of course that implies that they're not doing anything. The, the argument was whether to include that scene or to cut straight here in onto Hollywood Boulevard where they were looking at the stars instead of working. I mean, clearly they like they, they, a splinter had emerged, as in, like, that Mikey had, you know, started to take it more seriously. I think and started to appreciate what was involved and how much it meant to him. And the other two hadn't quite got it yet. So the issue was whether we put the scene in first to establish they've arrived in LA, and then later and they hadn't done anything that day. So that night, Mikey really wanted to do something, and they were still messing around. Or whether you could cut straight into Hollywood mm -hmm. Boulevard 
and, and see that they were messing about. But if you cut straight into Hollywood Boulevard, then it, perhaps they've just arrived in L.A. And then they're allowed to have some time and off. Then, yeah, and then you understand why they want to have some Can time off. Can we just off. take a moment to have a look at this beautiful lady here? <laughs> this is, yeah. Who Mike didn't know. The guy in worked the, the street. That was the Mr. He signed his release form. I mean, I wasn't there, obviously. Sorry to nick your side of things. But he, he signed no, his no, release no. form, Mr. X. No, uh, just an X. Just, just an, an X. X. <laughs> that was what yeah. he put down. Was a, that Mr. was his X pimp name. So uh, his release form just says X. I love that shirt of his, though. Yeah. And this is, a great, <laughs> this is a great piece of camera work here by Diego Rodriguez. It's I mean, just brilliant. I just sort of said to him, make sure you get the guy playing the guitar. I, didn't, <laughs> I hadn't thought to just come pan straight mm. over to him. But it is the contradiction of the fact that Sammy and Sammy and Woody were over there really working hard in Guatemala and these guys aren't. And I think that's why mm. that scene is integral to the, to the film. And we ended up cutting Mikey's cap trick here. It doesn't appear once in the film. It's a cap trick that Gaby can now do, balancing a cap on his head. And that's how he gets the money off. But it's quite a bit, it looks like he's selling the cap there. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. It looks like he sold the cap for $2. And you think, well, that's not a good deal. But actually, he had just done a trick with his cap. That's why he was giving it back. And this was immediately after Marcelo Vasquez bought them supper. Marcelo Vasquez was a guy we met outside LA Galaxy Stadium. And he, uh, he just, it was the most frustrating moment of the trip, or one of them, because he looked them in the eyes and he said, I know Maradona, I'll just call him for you. And I looked around, and one of the cameramen is in a cold sweat. I'm like, what's wrong? He goes, batteries run out. Batteries run out? This guy's going to, like, solve the whole film for them. In the end, it turned out that he didn't know Maradona and he didn't have his phone, or he did have his phone number, it was either the wrong one or no one was answering. <laughs> so it didn't end up being that important, but there was a moment where... No, he just wanted to film the boys and sell DVDs of them on the streets in LA. Yeah. We, unlike us, we wanted to film the boys and sell DVDs of them. The Everywhere. Shop. Everywhere. <laughs> so this is also, you know, another important scene. Yeah, I think, um, I think this is really... I suppose, where the audience sees Sammy for who he really is um, and, and start to understand him and accept some of his past misbehaviours. Um, but for us filming this, this was a very emotional time. Um, we were cooped up in the corner of that room, which was really, really small, uh, desperately trying to follow the action. And that little kid there, Eduardo, uh, Sammy really bonded with. And I think that that was really what made the family so accommodating towards us because they saw how kind Sammy was to the kid and uh, and Woody spent most of his time just sort of watching as, as the whole scene. Awkwardly sort of, in a way. Yeah I think he, he before he went there he didn't really understand um, about you know sort of uh, this way of life. Yeah and I think that he, he he kind of just sort of let Sammy do his thing and watched um, and sort of realised that I think he, before he before he came to places like Guatemala he kind of felt sorry for people and I think he realised how happy people are out there and, uh, and realised they don't need his pity necessarily, and I think that had a profound effect on him, but it was really all about Sammy when we went here, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's quite an important scene in the film. There's a lovely yeah, moment... Sorry, yeah, Eduardo falling asleep on his... <laughs> There's a lovely moment here where they, which, we, which we cut from the film, uh, but where Woody sort of was so touched by their hospitality of letting them sleep on this floor... <laughs> um, no, but he gave, him, he gave them his Nike shirt, uh, and, and he presented them with his, his shirt... And they were like looking at it, thinking, "Wow, you know, we can sell that and eat for a month, you know, and what we could, what we do." And then he signed it to the lovely family of Chichi Castaneda. Thank you so much, and love Woody and, and Sammy, told, and told them to frame it and put it on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I know. And you just thought that's literally they just were watching us while he signed it, as if to say, "Please don't write over our <laughs> only earnings." It was a very sweet moment. I think the other thing that's important about this and the way it was cut is that we always said that we were going to try and hold back a lot about their character. You know, Sammy talks about his sister being killed there. Mikey talks about his friends dying. And I think we always wanted, we didn't really want the characters to come out within the first five minutes. We wanted to slowly reveal it all. And I think that moment is, is where Sammy reveals it and you actually suddenly, like Gabe says, understand what he went through. Well, I think we, yeah, we certainly wanted to put it together like a piece of fiction so that you would learn about their characters through conflict and through what the obstacles they had to overcome and you'd have your questions about them answered as those questions became relevant rather than do a kind of more conventional documentary setup and you know say this is x this is y and this is z although we couldn't actually get x y or z to come and appear in the film so we had to use the boys were they all quite at this point between the three of them on your side were they all a bit were they arguing as much as it looks like they are. I mean, yeah, most of them. They were just arguing all the time, because Sammy and Woody were getting on quite well, well on our side. Well, they, the, the split, in a way, in effect, the split had already happened before, you know, Mikey... There's a minute, in a minute, Mikey comes back with the money and says, yeah, I'm going to go it alone. But they, it effectively, 
at this point. They'd already kind of split because they were doing separate things most of the day. And they said, yeah, they were doing very separate things. Mikey was working, and Danny and Jeremy weren't. So they'd get up in the morning, and Danny and Jeremy would go and have breakfast and do whatever, and not go and earn any money. And Mikey would go out and do what he could, earn some cash, not have breakfast. So there was a lot of frustration between the three of them. So, yeah, there was definitely already a, a, a divide between the three of them, for sure. I love this shot that you've got in a second of the revolution is just around the corner. It's just <laughs> absolutely <laughs> perfect, perfect shot. The revolution is just around the corner. It's just, like, absolutely just brilliant at that moment. And now the money montage. Again, that shot you saw that opened that montage is about half past four in the morning. <laughs> but this this music we didn't originally intend to use. We were going to have something South American. Track, yeah, and yeah. We just used it to, yeah, as a guide track. And then it stayed. Great. In fact, I actually remember Leo saying, no, don't like the song. And then the next time coming in going, I actually quite like that song. And then the next time coming in and going, I love that song. It's got to stay. <laughs> it was a contender originally. We got get James gave it to us originally from New York, yeah, to start the piece off with. It works great in this scene. It does. On Soccer AM, Helen Chamberlain went wild for that and started screaming, Sammy, he's got a pineapple on his head. Yeah. <laughs> so he should know. This was amazing to film as well, like, just when we were staying in those markets and <laughs> filming on the back of this. This actually, this, this car broke down, didn't it, while they were on it? Yeah, it did. This car broke down and then they had to hitchhike for the rest of the journey. Which that was we didn't have time to put it in the film, but... It was quite a funny conversation, because he, isn't it, when he, the guy comes and tells them, you know, the car's broken down. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, why won't you take us any further? Sam Woody, because he doesn't understand the Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit upset with this you. is everybody's. I mean, so many people love this scene in the film, and it actually sort of—it's not supposed to be that funny. I mean, obviously it is, but yeah. no, it was, it was supposed to be quite serious because they. That this is part. There's a comp quite a big contrast here between Mikey and Danny and Jeremy. I.e., Mikey's. Well, actually, no, that's not right. It's between Danny and Jeremy and the people who they're with, because these people who they're with are prepared to do literally anything to make their dream come true. They might be a little bit nuts, but they're really committed. And the other, and you know. Danny and Jeremy at this point, like, we really want to meet Maradona, we really want to meet Maradona, but in contrast, they're not prepared to do anything to get there. I mean, maybe understandably, probably understandably, I wouldn't have wanted to dress up like Shrek or like Puss in Boots. Really? Would you have been bothered? If, if you well, had a dream like that to meet your hero, you wouldn't have put on an outfit? I don't think it's that big maybe a Maybe Puss in Boots. Right, not Shrek. Though. No, I think you should no. have. I think the problem, I right, agree. is if Mikey had said, I'm going to do this, which he didn't want to do because yeah. he went off on her money, then he would have. And I, I, agree. And I if I wanted to do this, we would have dressed up. And the fact of the matter is, Danny says now, I, I didn't even really want to, I don't want to shave. If they yeah. can give me a costume I don't need to shave, then I'll do it. And I think I the think fact of the matter is that was... Everyone had a point in the film where they, every, all of the boys had a point during the trip where they got it, where they realised what they had to do. And Danny and Jeremy just hadn't got there yet. They do get there. They get there when they're in Vegas. But still at this point, they hadn't realised what it was going to, what it was going to take to achieve this. This is crazy. This was a really funny interview. You only got a bit of it in here, but yeah. I remember when we came back and we sort of showed each other the rushes. I remember watching this and thinking that you guys have got an unbelievable interview here. And in that, on that couch in between them, there's a guy asleep on that couch in between them. Yeah. <laughs> on that dirt really, couch. Yeah, I really, <laughs> is that Mike? It's, <laughs> but I regret that we didn't get a good shot and put that in the film with them walking by it because there was just because this is like this is a minute and a half off Hollywood Boulevard. Where like it's, it's unbelievable how close it's, to like the Rasmus it's just desolation it was and home. Disgusting around there. The place we stayed was absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Where did you stay? What do you mean in LA? Yeah, just a nasty little motel with Is that the La Brea? The La Brea. Is that where Divine Brown and Hugh Grant had a bit of an altercation? That is that is the same hotel. We saw that Divine is. Brown before. I don't think that was that was a better looking version. Much better looking version. But Mr. Much. X is also his her pimp. It's the same pimp. I think this is a really lovely... I mean, you've got that brilliant line from Danny there about boy or girl, and then you cut back to Mike, who's just totally serious about doing it and repeats, $255 yeah. again and again. But immediately after this, he almost got... Almost, he gives this great interview and then gets up and almost got knocked over by a <laughs> UPS fan that came storming down the road next to it. It would have been a perfect end to this part. And the film would have to be dedicated This to is Mike. also the first time that the boys ever talk about the camera crew. Because there was this big thing about, you know, do they talk about the camera crew? Do we put, you know, obviously Ben and Leo are about to appear when Mikey sort of jumps Don't behind the away. camera and hugs them. But it's the first time you mentioned it, because I went in without a camera crew and I and I made $255. And so we had a bit of a debate about that, about whether they should... Because obviously, although we were there, but we, we weren't helping them. And I don't think we ever wanted people to think we were. So we were quite conscious of that. If you talk about another moment where you want to you want to give the boys some advice, they're in LA, there's three or four massive British pubs full of people watching football. And Mike, it took this long for Mike to realise that all he had to do was go and perform that. Mm. So this, uh, we both sort of felt on watching the rushes caved in we that this is really shot in the way that we wanted it. It's closest to what we really wanted. Yeah. I think we, we sort of had thought that 
a lot of a lot of fiction pieces are now shot documentary style. So it was quite interesting to try and shoot a fiction uh, documentary fiction style, as it were. And I think that Diego really uh, really got exactly what we were looking for at this point. It was very easy. Rodriguez to cut. rather than Maradona. Diego Rodriguez rather than remember. Maradona. Yeah. It was pretty easy to cut, and they put together the slickest battery change that I ever saw. Very very slick. What do you mean? Like a formula, they were like a formula. It was like a Formula One pit stop. <laughs> Diego ran out of batteries, whipped it off the, his battery out the back, put it behind his back, spun it on the way. Diego and Dingleberry had one ready, popped it in his hand. It's back on the camera in seconds. This was during this scene. During this scene, I hardly missed anything. There is this moment as when Danny and Jeremy we just sort of missed it when they walk up and they go. Um, which I always think is really funny about Mike, because he's a bit of a wine, I imagine. He knew perfectly well that the boys hadn't dressed up and they hadn't earned their money. And he goes, where's your outfits? Which you can't actually really hear that well, but it was a perfect moment where Mike just winds them up, knowing perfectly well that they hadn't dressed up, and whereas he had made all this money. This was another really tense moment in the film for us as well. It was like Mike had come to us beforehand and said, listen, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about telling them that I want to go on my own, I'm thinking about splitting up, and... We kind of felt this was uh, going to be a massive moment, and it was very tense watching Danny and Jeremy's reaction to that. And it sort of plays at that. It sort of plays itself out over th like three scenes, doesn't it? There's this one, and then coming up, there's a the conversation he has with Jeremy when they when they go along, and then there's the argument over the money. Yeah, yeah. And that took place over was it was it one day? Yeah, one day. And this was the day that we were out of you couldn't contact us, right? You were in deepest, darkest Guatemala. Mm. Yeah, and we could not be contacted. Contacted. That was, had, that was weird for us, though. We, we couldn't ever speak to you. Like, that was funny that we didn't know what was going on on the other side of the film. And we spent a fortune on those stupid satellite phones. And they never worked. But didn't work. They were, like, as big as, a, like, a laptop computer, and they, we just couldn't get in touch with each other. So much of our equipment didn't work. You'd so be much of You'd be amazed. Uh, well, it's a low-budget film. Much. This was actually... This, is, uh, this was in the airport, and... Um, just before they left, and both of the boys were trying to chat up that girl there. Mm. Um, Who's remarkably tall. She was standing on a step. Up yeah, she was standing on but a look step. at this, I mean, look at this sort of <laughs> playful banter in front of this girl. I think this is this the is weakest terrible. scene in the film, though, don't you? Just that if it hadn't have been at this point, and if we hadn't have needed to break it up here, do you think we would have put it in? Definitely not. It's a necessary evil. But we needed, we, to be fair, we did need to cut, otherwise it goes Danny's scene, Danny and Mikey's scene, to a Danny and Mikey scene, so we did need something from... Sammy to cut in between, I guess. It's purely functional. But I also think it came off the back of some of the test screenings we did when people said that they didn't know yeah. where we were or where we were going at times, didn't understand the timeline. So it was important to place them. It is confusing. That <laughs> you know, people came back, they didn't know. Why were they going back to California? Why are they flying up? They that was one of the biggest things. problems we had. Yeah. Everyone came out crying, laughing and everything else, but then saying... Yeah what was going on. They had no idea why they were crying. Why they were no. crying. <laughs> so therefore we put in lots of things like that in airports just to make it clear that they were flying from... Where did they fly from? Guatemala to Brazil, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's Brazil. what they raised money for. This was a great scene. It is a great we scene. Didn't, we didn't want to cut away um, from the action because it, it was all going so smoothly on this side. And for the other boys, they'd kind of arrived at that point uh, and they were just getting on the plane. So it's good to be dive back in here as quick as possible and, and get a move really, on with it all. This was the moment where Danny... Was, where Danny and Jeremy realised that Mike was planning on keeping not just the money he'd earned on his own, but also a third of the money they'd raised together. And, it's it's uh, also the moment that splits everybody, where it splits us as well. Was, yeah. was, it, this is the moment where you debate, is Mikey right to leave his mates and go on his own, or should he stay together and raise money together and help them out? And fail, in essence. Well, they might have made it. I mean, Danny and Jeremy nearly made it. They yeah, but the, pro earlier. the proof of the last week or so was... I'm not saying Mike was right or wrong, but the proof of the last what week do you was think? that they... What, whether Mike was right or wrong? Yeah, you were there. I think it's probably wrong to, lo to leave your mates wherever the situation. But he was justified, I guess, to some people that he made it and he got to meet Diego. This, the the uh, Dingleberry and Diego Rodriguez also gave another amazing moment to, to me because I overheard the two of them arguing about it. Dingleberry's our runner. Dingleberry, yeah, he's the runner. And they were having an argument and one of them was saying that, you know, that he was wrong and one was saying he was right. I'm not going to say who. And, uh, you know, there was massive controversy, like, <laughs> yeah. huge controversy. But then, then I sort of realised, God, this really, this really might be great. This really might split an audience and it really might, like, resonate yeah. a little mm -hmm. bit. And... I think it did. I think a lot of people think Mikey was wrong and a lot of people think, well, Mikey had to leave because he had this dream and he had to go. And I think that's definitely something that we really wanted to happen was people walk out of the cinema going, was he right or was he wrong? And there's also the moment with you know with Sammy earlier on. That's also kind of a, I've heard people discuss that. What? What do you mean? Well, not, he, not giving the ticket. Yeah, he said he would. 
So, you know, should you always stick to your word or... I mean, he changed that in this, you know, that day was his tipping point. So by the evening, he was a kind of, well, he's a different person to the morning, but he had a different view by the evening. Yeah, but you say that, but the fact of the matter is, I actually went to the cinema with Sammy in Leeds when it was on uh, a few weeks ago, and we sat next to each other in the cinema, I sat at the back. And when that was being drawn out of the hat in Acapulco, he turned to me and literally, he really shocked me. He genuinely said this. He turned to me and he goes, This is the turning point of my entire life when my name gets drawn out of that hat. And you just think, wow, like that, this really has had an effect on them. This film has actually changed their lives. And the fact that he got to, you know, meet Diego, and we assume that we're not ruining the film because you probably watched the film first without the commentary. Um, and he actually genuinely thinks that this moment is the moment that changes his life. And therefore, why shouldn't you renege on a word to Woody, you know? That's pleasure. actually pretty scary when you say that. It's like to us, it was still just a film, and the fact is that to some of these guys, it has changed mm. their lives. He genuinely whispered to me that this is the moment that changed my life. If my name hadn't been drawn out, you know. And the famous Fernando, Gabe. Fernando. He's my boy. Yeah, me and Gabe had a bit of an argument about whether Fernando was good or bad for the film. I think he's very good for the film. Yeah. Look, here he is taking us around the slums of Brazil. This was, um, at this, it was quite a cool favela, actually. Um, it was one of the safer ones, because I think we got a lot of advice not to go <laughs> to the favelas, because they don't really like crews and stuff. Wasn't this where City of Gobba shot? I thought there was. I've got no idea. Mm, I think it was. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I remember being it's, told. It's pretty freaky, that, the kid it with his arms. It is pretty freaky. Malnourishment will do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> the, these, uh, these girls were actually met on Copacabana Beach, and uh, we thought they were just another bunch of people that were going to promise stuff and not actually deliver, but they said they'd cook dinner, and that's exactly what they did, and that's exactly what the boys needed, because at this point in the journey, they didn't need travel money anymore. They just needed to eat, and uh, Sammy ate his and her food. Fernando was a great character in the film. Uh, there was uh, some funny moments with him. There was one night when he turned to Gabe and he said... Um, I, we'll try and tell the story quickly, but he basically turned to Gabe and said, oh, do you want to meet Janinio? <laughs> do you want to meet Janinio? Janinio is a mate of mine, you know, and we sort of thought, wow, you know, Middlesbrough star, and he'd be great for the film. We showed him some tricks. Middlesbrough star? We didn't think Middlesbrough star. Well, we thought it, Brazilian legend. Okay, Brazilian legend, so we thought absolutely minutes. amazing. So Gabe comes back to the hotel. Do you want to tell the story or should I tell the story? So, so comes comes back to the hotel, goes, oh, my God, everybody get out of bed. It's two in the morning. Get out of bed. Quickly get out of bed. We've got to go down to this guy's house. Um, Fernando's going to introduce us to Janinius. Everyone gets out of bed. The sound man's knackered. The runners are knackered. The cameraman's knackered. They get out. We would go across Rio de Janeiro. Let's, let's, no, they wouldn't, no, they wouldn't get out. We had they to go with Russ's camera. Are you we sure? Went, we, we I'm pretty sure Ross. the Beecroft went. They're waiting in the they're waiting in the lobby of the hotel. Oh, that's right. We so with... we get there. We finally get there. Open the door. Everyone's out of bed, waiting in the lobby to be called over. And this guy answers the door. And it's Janino, the beach player, <laughs> who no one had ever heard of, was some old bloke. We've got everybody out of bed, and uh, it wasn't Janino, so we couldn't be rude. So we had to stay around and film him, even though he was obviously never going to make the film. But um, that was one of the moments where we got very excited and were let down. And this is Leo and Ben's big moment. Yeah, well, the, 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 the shot just before was the uh, woman who owns the pub, who actually ended up giving Mikey $100 on top of the $100 that he'd earned. Well, they didn't know about it at this point. Unfortunately, he didn't know about it, otherwise he wouldn't have had a scene. But uh, just a big thank you. But this was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, this was an amazing moment. Even the yeah, I looked over and even the boom was quivering, just in the sound. Just in the sound. Was, in tears as well, we were all in tears. Pop. Of course, from Diego, who was holding the camera steady. It's also worth saying there's a lovely piece of music here that was composed for us by Matthew Rosaic over this bit, which really is. Yeah, there's right. Ben. There's Ben Turner. There I am. There's Ben Turner. And there is the big Yeti that is. Leo Palmer. Oh, no, that's Justin. There we go, Leo. There you go. Give him a hug. People pay thousands for that sort of bear hug. We <laughs> <laughs> could do it. A lot of people say that we shouldn't have kept that in, that it ruins the illusion and they're upset when they see you guys behind the camera. But me and Ben insisted. We <laughs> wanted to be in the film. Yeah. So, <clears throat> aside from any creative issues, we just felt like we needed a moment but in the it, limelight. But it is, it is one of those moments where you don't, we didn't know whether to put it in or not, because it does ruin the illusion that they are... Well, we'd said to the, the, the crew and everyone beforehand, very specifically, don't make eye contact with him, don't talk to him now. When he makes it, he has to be alone, because he had split up from the others, and part of splitting up from the others is you don't get to share the good moments as well as the bad moments. Then he dived on us. <laughs> it did, though, <laughs> would have cut it. But it's also nice because it means he is on his own. He doesn't have anybody else to celebrate with apart from you two. Yeah. So. No, he showed you had the most balls out of any of them, I think, at this point. None of the others would have ever gone off alone, I don't think. Woody, maybe. But I was amazed that Mikey took that decision, and it was really, really brave to do so, whether you think he was right or not. He genuinely was on his own. 
with us. Personally, I love that bit. I don't believe that there are rules of um, what you should and shouldn't do to break illusions or so on. It just worked in the film. It was a nice moment, and uh, I think it's very important to the film. It's also the moment that I never really thought would happen. I didn't ever think... I mean, it's, it shows the gravitas of this trip and how much it meant to all of these boys that they that this happens and, and, and Mikey, a character who does start the film as a bit of a joker, can have this breakdown. And I think this is obviously a defining moment where you realise, wow, this, this, this really has affected them and, and changed their lives. One of my favourite memories of the film is uh, when we met up in, uh, in Argentina, showing you that, showing the two of you that, and you just, like, I was so, you know, so proud of it. It was a shame because Leonard stay, Leo had stayed behind to uh, keep an eye on those two and shoot what we thought was going to be, you know, the end of their trip, mm. basically. And I, and I remember just opening up and just showing us, being really proud of it. That, yeah. That, that, that it was happened. amazing to watch. I remember watching it and just thinking, wow, that is just something I never ex expected to happen with Mikey, and it was beautiful. And there's the sideshow Bob shot. It looks like, <laughs> looks like Jeremy's got green hair. <laughs> <laughs> um... It was weird, actually, I think, for all of us that we didn't know what was going on with the other half of the film. Like, we didn't realise until we got back to the edit suite what had happened on the other side. I remember not really ever really understanding. I just heard little words and got odd emails saying, Mikey's thinking of leaving, Mikey is leaving, Mikey's gone, Leo stayed behind, Ben's going with him. It was all just totally manic. And it got to one stage of the trip where we said that, you know, we expected this to be a very small, contained film with a small crew with the four of us hanging together all the time. And suddenly it got to one day in the trip and we were... Ben was in... Argentina shooting with Mikey, Leo was in Vegas shooting uh, Jeremy, shooting Jeremy Danny. and Danny, me and Gabe were in Brazil on the beach shooting um, shooting uh, Woody and Sammy and then my sister was shooting in Leeds, was shooting Emma, which didn't make it into the film, uh, Sammy's ex-girlfriend. So sort of all around the world in one day. Yeah. I think Jeremy gets a lot of credit here for what he says, I think that's... was yeah. He's a gent in this point. He is a gent. No one talks about the fact that Mike's hair's sticking up in the middle. And looks very silly. Mr. Majika esque. You can't really see it now because the camera's gone off it, but he looks like. looks a bit silly. Lovely moment here. Lovely moment. Two of them hugging. There was a lot of hugging. <laughs> there was a lot of hugging. We were a very hugging crew as well. You, very you, give, a, you give a good hug. Ben loves mm. a hug. Love yeah. Hug. I'm the only one who doesn't really like hugging. I that think Danny looks completely him. broken here, by the way. Oh. I think this is the point where Danny realises what the trip means and I think from here on he sort of kicks in and goes but there were, there were two stages for them because there was one like appreciating the work that needed to get put in they did they, that they got earlier than they appreciating that it wasn't just working hard that they needed to go out and perform and get the money off the you know there was a whole dynamic that they need to set up when they go in somewhere performing not just stand in the middle of the street doing kick ups and hope that people throw money at them mm. I also think there was a difference between talking a good game and actually you know delivering but I do think that once they got to Vegas, Danny and Jeremy, you know, they worked their bollocks off. They did, like, 10, 12-hour stints, and that's when they got it. That's when they realised what they had to do. This was a difficult interview to cut, because he just babbled on for about 20 minutes, and basically everything he said for that 20 minutes was we Gold wanted to put in, yeah. Well, this was something about Sammy throughout the whole shoot. When yeah. he started, you couldn't stop him, which is great, but at the same time, this was a hard one. Yeah. Him and Woody, you'd interview them, you could ask him one question and find yourself, like, at the tape change, having not said anything else. We actually had um, Russ on Boom here, Russ DeWolf, another one of our runners, was on Boom here uh, because our, our sound man was ill. And when we went in to, to shoot this here, uh, they'd obviously gone in there to sort out Sammy's trainer situation. And uh, there was loads and loads of noise in the shop because we obviously couldn't close the shop off because, you know, we weren't communicating that easily with uh, the shopkeepers. They'd just about let us film in there, but there were people everywhere. And uh, Russ did a great job, and so did um, Delaney, Lee, uh, Gav, Phil and Phil. But it wasn't the sound, only time Russ, out. Russ, uh, Russ enjoyed... had a lot of stories with Russ and Booms. Yeah, he you know, ironic it. that he did such a good job that time with the boom. <laughs> yes, Russ, our runner, actually left on his first day of this shoot in New York. Left the boom pole. How do you leave a boom pole in a cab and then uh, spend the day running around New York looking for the every that's ca stopping the cab. every that's cab. The cab? Oh no, they're, they're all, all cab. yellow, Russ. Mm. They're all yellow. So it wasn't the best day to his uh, film career, but now he's doing very well yeah. and hasn't lost mm. a boom pole since. No, not told. for a long time. Other equipment's gone missing. Just, so his, his name changed from Russell DeWolf Booth to Russell <laughs> Boom Pole. <laughs> well, just to clarify, because at the moment it sounds like we had about 50 runners. <laughs> we had two runners with 25 names each. <laughs> yeah, with lots of nicknames. We're very big on nicknames it's in this company. Massive. But they were, they were actually, you know... You, they're, Aren't we Chucky? They were very... <laughs> 
Yes, we are sweet pea. <laughs> they were very important to us, actually, on the shoot, because they, really it needed to be constantly all hands on deck. And they were those, much more than runners. Those two, yeah, they really, like, they would do whatever was necessary, and they, they really made a huge difference. To say we couldn't have done it without them, we probably could have, but it wouldn't have been so good. I mean, they, they really, like, they were incredible. Definitely could have done it without them. The Grassy Falls is actually on the left of this shot. We had to uh, we had to cut the sound there when Sammy and Woody come down the stairs because um, they look in awe at the the falls. But uh, Woody's Woody's way of describing it is by saying, "Oh, that's disgusting," <laughs> and uh, we didn't think that was rewind it. Watch the lip sync; you'll see him just go, "That is disgusting." So we took the sound out because we wanted it to be a beautiful moment. And I think they were blown away by it, but Woody's way of describing it didn't necessarily fit. Yeah. So uh, we had to cut sound. It was a very tense moment filming at Aggressive Falls because um, we didn't. It was very difficult to get permission to film there and they literally gave us sort of five minutes and, and, and so we had to set up and there's millions and millions of people all around there so we didn't want millions of people in this shot so we suddenly had to get our crew to just block everybody off and be in the way and just take big group photos that people couldn't walk past while we shot Sammy and Woody uh, walking down saying that is disgusting. But it was, it was, a, uh, it was quite tense because we were also knew that we had to catch the bus to get to Argentina because they'd managed to book on this specific bus so that was just a very tense moment in the shoot. I think it's also worth mentioning here the beautiful original score from the prosaic. Yeah, Matthew Rosaic's done a prosaic. Has done a great. This is something he composed for us, and it's an, a, just a great shot here. Yeah. Which we didn't really expect them to do all of this business, but we loved it when they did. This was going to be the original. We, we were thinking about using this as the original poster for the film, weren't we? Yeah. This kind of gives a bit too much away. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it shows they got the there <laughs> and who got there. Yeah, true. They, they had an amazing night in Vegas at this point, didn't they? There was one night where we'd been constantly shooting, so we gave everybody a night off. Um, and it was the best piece of performance they'd done for about a week and a half. Do you remember? Yeah, they, they worked through the night through in Vegas. Everyone was around. Because they finally got it. Yeah, they finally, yeah. that's exactly it. They finally got it. I remember Danny playing dead in the middle of the, of the middle of the boulevard, so like everyone was just like stop and worry about him and like all these people, big crowd together. That, then, was, that was the night you went missing. Or filming. Yeah, or filming. I lost you for hours, dude. I was worried. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a tough night. It was a tough night. Where did you go? How much did you, how much did you win that night? It was the night before that I played. <laughs> that <laughs> night I was sleeping in the car while you were working. No, no, no. You shot this, Ben, didn't you? Because you'd um, broken the crew just yeah. before this all happened. When you said broken them, do you mean like actually have them, make them have a breakdown because you're working them so hard? Justin, was, bro them? Justin yeah. was broken. <laughs> yeah, the sound man. Completely broken. And uh, yeah, and we turned up there. We, we, I didn't. Yeah, we'd, we'd given them a day off, but for the last week and a half, we'd been, tomorrow you'll have a day off, and then didn't give them a day off, tomorrow you'll have a day off, and they didn't get a day off. So eventually, we got to Argentina and had to honour the day off. So, yeah, I, I did. But, shoot, this, this was the other example of me standing outside a stadium, not able to go in there while everyone else enjoyed <laughs> the game. You talk about days off. Diego and Dewsbury, who were on our side of the trip, yeah. pretty much refused time off. That's true. They wanted to shoot all the time. It is worth it is worth at this point just saying that I mean this was an unbelievably hard shoot for everyone because we were wanting to roll all the time and there was always stuff happening. You know, you can't tell Mikey to stop working and stop making the story happen. So our crew of Giuliano, Justin, Jim, Diego, Matt Beecroft, George, uh, Russ and Dewsbury were just absolute monsters for us. I love this moment when he just says he looked in my eyes, and obviously you know perfectly well that Diego didn't look anywhere near him, got straight in the car, and uh, that's just great. It's funny, because um, whenever you watch the film through, you remember about all the stuff you think you missed when you were on the shoot. I mean, I remember talking with the boys on numerous occasions about, I can't believe we missed that, and oh man, I can't believe we missed that. Um, and it's so weird when you're shooting, because we were shooting, what, two and a half hours a day on each camera, uh, on average. Um, so you can imagine how much stuff went on that we couldn't actually capture. Uh, and I remember being crippled by fear, really, thinking that we'd missed all the good stuff and then came back to cut the film and I think we were all right in the end, but it was it was a very kind of weird feeling. Well, it got a lot easier as the trip went on to know what to shoot, because at the beginning you sort of have Las Malvinas on Argentinas. The Falkland has belong to Argentina, if anyone doesn't speak Spanish. And Mikey looking his best looking he's ever looked in this scene. Oh, yeah, he, he looks, looks beautiful great, yeah. in this. Yeah. But really as, we, lovely. as we got to Argentina, it became a lot easier to shoot the film, because most of the story was already, was already in place. 
and you just knew what the strands to follow were. It was much more predictable what they were going to do at the beginning. We never, didn't know who was going to screw who over later on, who was going to end up being really good friends with who, what was going to happen. So you have to shoot everything in a way so that you've got the setup later on to put it together. What the editing and shooting from Argentina onwards was a lot easier because it, it, this story we just, you know, it dictated. It was the split that gave it the structure. Yeah. Once it split in Acapulco, you kind of had a feel for where you're going to go, and once Mike left as well, similarly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was just um, it was just the moments though, because you knew when you were going to shoot and what you were going to shoot. But I still felt towards the end that there were there were moments, little moments that would happen when we weren't rolling, and you think oh, that's such a beautiful moment. Yeah. How do we not get that? So I think even though you're both 100 percent right. And it was very, very. Uh, it was very much easier to to know what to shoot once we'd split. It's not really what I'm saying. It was more about just those little moments that happened, you know, just before they went to bed or just when they got up, and you'd see them and think, oh, that would, would have just made a really sort of beautiful, subtle moment. And and uh, yeah, just just beat myself up about it the whole way through, but it uh, turned out alright. One of the uh, one of the amazing surprises of the trip was how much the people of Argentina took to the boys when they got there. Because you do, you hope that would be the way. But we'd been travelling most of our time, at least you know, me and Leo had been in in America, where they don't know, really know who Maradona is. You couldn't have cared less. You couldn't have cared less. <laughs> and then suddenly we get to we get to Argentina, and they just loved it. They loved the tricks. They loved the mission. They loved the kids, and you know everything opened up for them. And it was just so normal to them that they would be doing this. Yeah. Didn't uh, didn't uh, didn't Cassie? Cassie, an old friend of Ben's, filmed this. Um, she actually <sighs> burst into tears when she was uh, when she was filming this scene, which I thought was a little pathetic. But she did a great job and she helped out. We didn't have a camera. I didn't know a cameraman with me, so Cassie did a really good job. And then Kenji did a good job. Chinese cameraman I found in LA. Um, you had to find crew from anywhere because everyone was gone. You're yeah, on me, your own in this place. Yeah, me and Kenji work. didn't speak the same language at all. <laughs> it's Hence, none of the footage I got when in the film. It's, it's interesting, actually, though, because this was shot on a different camera um, and you can tell the quality of it is slightly worse than mm. the cameras that we were using, obviously, because the cameras we were using in different locations and Lee had to find anyone with any camera, really. <laughs> but I think it actually really works to our benefit because it looks grainier and it doesn't look as looks nice. It's like one of those POW videos. Yeah, exactly, and it, it's like it, it, feels, it feels much more... Um, it, well, it expresses exactly what they were going through. Uh, they were completely the broken at that point. Yeah, they were definitely more defined. Than broken? Yeah. They yeah wanted, right. It was that point that they were broken, they were like, do you know what, we're still going to do it. That's true. We met another guy here who claims to meet Maradona. I've still got the photograph he gave me of him and Maradona <laughs> at Barcelona's training ground about 15 years earlier. And then the mate of Diego Maradona's lawyer, who claimed to um, have a very easy avenue straight into Diego and never materialised into anything. It was one of the main things in Argentina. Everybody is so obsessed with Diego that they all know someone who knows someone who wants walked his dog or something. Like Everybody says, oh, I know him, I know him. Taxi driver says, oh, I know his father, Daniel Arcucci, knows him. So um, the boys got very excited lots of times when people said, uh, we can help you, and then didn't materialise. But Arcucci gave them the idea here that they should actually sort of just stop going to the media, and then Diego might notice them a bit more. The original plan was just to camp outside his house, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, camp outside his house. He'll eventually see us. Arcucci was a great guy, actually, and I think he'd been following Maradona's career the whole way through, so he gave really spot-on advice. And uh, we kind of followed what he said until the boys got in the taxi and decided just to go and... Uh, straight to Maradona's house, which is the one thing he said we shouldn't do. <laughs> but during this period, uh, they were really having the time of their lives. Everyone was loving the trip. They were in newspapers, as you can see here. And that's in La Boca, isn't it? Right by where the Bombonera is. Yeah. Yeah, they were just, uh, they were just absolutely blitzing uh, Argentina at this point. And, uh, yeah, it looked like we were definitely going to meet him. No drama at all. And it was uh, very shortly afterwards that we <laughs> were to find out that Maradona was only going to be in Argentina for another few days. A few minutes. A few, yeah. They literally, a few like they literally found out that he was going in the. I know, but a few days from here. Oh, I see. It was that day. No, that's the day. That's a couple of days oh, before yes, when they went right. down to the to the to sort it out, basically. I love this cab driver. I just yeah. think he's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> this was the last cut of the film. There was a, a forty-five second scene here which we cut, or 45 seconds from this scene, which we cut, which I think is on the extras. Yes. But this was the last cut uh, of the film. It was in until the finish line. With uh, this driver getting Woody's name wrong, which we found really funny. We put it in, you can have a look at it on the deleted scenes. He can't say Woody because there's no W in 
Spanish, is there? I don't know, I don't speak Spanish. But I think you might have made that up. But I'm, I'm sure, sure there's a W in Spanish. <laughs> Do you think? I think they pronounce it. I don't think there is, because you couldn't say Woody. So the, the, it was just, we found it hilarious. And we, it was about 4 a.m. in the morning, we would nearly finish this eight-month edit process, <laughs> and we found this scene of this taxi driver not being able to pronounce Woody's name and calling him it was Woody. the funniest thing I've ever seen in my yeah. entire life. And we literally just just laugh like we'd never laugh we cried for about yeah. an hour put it in the film put it in front of an audience and they didn't find it that as funny as we did and to be fair by lunchtime the next day it wasn't anywhere near as funny no as it wasn't 4 but we still kept it in until <laughs> the final moment when we had to lose time I still think it's a shame it's gone out actually um, my brother-in-law is devastated he loved it hmm. people did love it I think it was quite funny but that, that's what the DVD's for that's why. That's what we'll sell. It will yeah, be the otherwise. Woody. It will be that cab driver mispronouncing the word Woody, which will be the thing that sells this DVD. Hundred percent right. That's all it is. Every time that we had a scene that we had to take out, we just reassured by the fact. Well, well, we'll put it on the DVD extras. That that'll be okay. Made it less painful. This I love this shot so much. This is one of my. Or this kind of the way this scene shot through the back window. It's primarily shot through the back window because we didn't want Diego to see us filming his house. But it was one of those happy coincidences. It works nicely. And he's hilarious. He is so funny when he speaks to them and they don't have a clue what he's saying. But it's a bit sort of Spanglish, isn't it? What do they call it? Mm. It's kind of half Spanish, half English. When you listen to him closely, he does drop in English words. But it is lucky Diego Rodriguez, our cameraman, can translate for them. Yeah. Mikey's got the aviators on here. I think he's, uh, he's beginning to believe the hype. <laughs> Then this music was used in an O2 advert after we decided it, which isn't great. Mm, but it was. Uh, is it, it was that pop. music? I always thought it was. Yeah. It was <laughs> the one where it explodes the ball. Yeah. yeah that's... I didn't. I thought it sounded similar. I didn't realise it was. It's they another, picked our music. It's another version of it. Is was it, it Suvaris? This, uh, no. No, it's sort of part of the um, the stuff we got from Cold Cut through uh, uh, Ninja, 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 Tunes. Ninja Tunes. This is so. before that track got commercial, though. Yeah, exactly. We had it before it went commercial. Yeah. I think there was real belief amongst us now. We were, you know, we, the fact that the boys were on this TV show, this TV show is absolutely huge in, um, in Argentina. Everybody watches it and they love it. And everybody says that the only thing that you can guarantee about Diego, you don't know what time he's going to get out of bed, you don't know what he's going to be doing, but you know he will watch this show. And uh, therefore, for these boys to get on it, they just really felt that this was the moment that they could actually appeal to him and they could really sort of make this dream happen. Um, so there's a lot of build-up to it and obviously ends in disappointment in this scene anyway. Someone could have helped Willie with the pronunciation before this. Hey, yeah, no. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I think that's part of the joy of it, really. The joy? Yeah. The, the, the charm? The charm, the charm. Yeah. He actually practised this for hours and hours yeah. and hours. I saw and the hours. footage of that outside in the car park. Hours Didn't he practised this. Yeah. It's very funny. And all these four presenters are all quite famous footballers who claim to sort of be friendly with Diego as well. And then... This is it. This is the phone call that they got saying Maradona uh, hadn't seen the show and he looked really upset and we were actually stood by and, and the boys didn't know yet and we didn't know what the drama was but we thought it was much worse than he just had been sleeping through it. How come and Benny Hill's in the shot? <laughs> 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 I thought it was Penfold. I thought it was Penfold and Danger Mouse. <laughs> and he doesn't flinch. He just stands completely motionless. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Gabe, you were saying. No, 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 not at all. It's just that, that we thought it was much worse and then... Obviously, here it gets much worse, um, and uh, from here on, it was brutal, really, because uh, we were just as upset as the boys, and we had to obviously remember we were working, had to get all the stuff on film, um, and there's some. There were lots and lots of shots of them sort of crying and upset, um, and here you can see Woody's just completely and utterly broken. I definitely think we thought it was the end here. I mean, there was there was no turning back for us. I mean, he was going to Peru. We checked up flights. The flights were leaving in about an hour. We were miles away from the airport. We just thought, this is it now. It, it's sort of over. Um, and this is Mike at his very cutest. Yeah, I agree. Coming up now. Do your best. What does he say? Please do your best. Everyone's waiting for Mike to be cute. Please do your best. Oh, oh bless oh, him, Mikey. that little Mikey. <laughs> it was just really sad. It actually just... I, mean, I think the four of us were sort of thinking, do we have a film now Diego isn't going to be in it? And I think that's definitely something that we were coming to terms with ourselves, that was this a film that would be successful without the ending of Diego and, and how could we make it work? This is Suvaris. Right, Suvaris. A beautiful track. It's another really great works. track on a wonderful soundtrack. Wasn't he, what did we use originally for that? Yeah, it was a Gomez song that you really liked for that. Yeah, yeah, there was a Gomez song originally in place there. Could we not it was too it? wordy. No, it was too wordy. 
I think this is where Woody also has sort of just a bit of a breakdown. Didn't really want to speak to anybody, didn't want to know, just sat on his own, wouldn't be interviewed. And he was just broken, you know. Uh, there's the producer trying to sort of bring him round and he just, just didn't want to know, really. And uh, it was quite sad. We were all a little bit low. And Mikey steps up here. Mikey brings them home. And on their way. This, oh, and this, I'm talking of music. I mean, this is Godspeed You Black Emperor. And uh, just the first time we put it on, it was like it had been written for the, it was almost perfect to the cut. Yeah, I remember we were sitting there, me and Ben were sat in the cut, and every time, because the, the song's how long? It's like 20 minutes long. Yeah. And um, every time we listened to it through with this scene in mind, and we were talking about how, the fact that it had to break in a few different places and change. And it literally just went through, and every time it, it changed, the, the, the sort of speed or the sound changed, it was perfect. And uh, I remember us sitting in a room and thinking, there's no way we're going to be able to get this, because we knew notoriously that they didn't allow their music to come, to, sorry, to be put in films. So um, Winston comes into the, uh, the edit suite and decides that he, he likes it too much to be told that we're not going to be able to use it. Uh, and then spends the next two weeks without telling anyone that he was um, going to clear it, and did. So yeah, I just big they, they basically just said that there's absolutely no way. They said give up. There's never any chance that we're ever going to allow this to be in a film. And it was actually a lot longer than two weeks. It was, I, I, I emailed her every morning for five weeks, every day. I'd wake up and write another pleading email saying, please release this music, please, please, please. Every day she wrote back saying no and stop bothering us. Eventually, I just drove them so mad that it was either put a sort of police weren't out on me to stop bothering them or clear it so she said all right well just send me the scene sent them the scene and and they loved it and they said this is the only the second ever film that they've allowed their music to be used in godspeed you black emperor and i just think it's a fantastic piece and just wasn't going to give up on it really mm. i mean it was we actually found another piece by mono which was going to yeah. be the replacement um but uh but it wasn't uh it didn't go through as many different phases as this and uh, I'm very, very happy now that we have this in because I think it sounds superb. And if anyone's wondering what Matt Beecroft, who we've spoken about a few times, looks like, <laughs> yeah. you're about to get a look at him now when Sammy bashes into him. Matt, Matt Beecroft coming up. There he is. There, no, no, that's, that's not, not him. him. <laughs> He's the one holding the camera. There we there go, Matthew. Hello, how are you? And Sammy, Sammy turns around because he actually bumps into the camera yeah. and it was a real shame because I think if he'd have run off there, the shot would have been much better. But uh, this bit was... Uh, oh, yeah, I think this is also when it gets really tense for us as well. Here's the second time I'm in there. Oh, just yeah, yeah, a little reflection there. Um, this is where it sort of all gets a little bit tense as well, because we just think, is it true? Is Diego actually going to see them? Everybody was just so overexcited and so tense. Um, and then we finally get to the, uh, to the door you know, of, of, of Maradona's house, and, of course, the guy comes out and says, we're not actually allowed to film. Uh, and uh, we, we thought we were about to have this scene where the boys were about to meet Diego and we weren't going to be able to film it, so it suddenly turned into a bit of a panic. A massive panic. <laughs> a massive panic. Bear in mind, we're all having the time of our lives here and Leo is grafting like an animal in Vegas, in Vegas yeah. with the boys, finding seven different cameramen, none of whom talk the language, <laughs> to do any kind of job to, to, uh, to get us footage from the other side. Um, I, was at, I, was on, <coughs> I was on a plane coming from coming to Buenos Aires with Danny and Jeremy at this point yeah. and I had no idea you were about to meet, potentially meet Diego. Yeah. It's just amazing. I love Sammy's face there when he looks out the window. Yeah. And here it is, the street, also shot on a different camera. That's a good combination of cameras breaking or mm. sound. Breaking. Yeah, it just all went a bit mad. We had to nab a journalist camera and then there was all sorts of things that went on which, uh, which we don't have time to go into now, but uh, with, with, with a journalist letting us film this on his camera so that Diego would allow it to be filmed and actually the compromise that we had, they were actually that TV channel was run by the Mafia, but the compromise that we couldn't really argue with because they are the Mafia was that they put it on their show the next morning, which at the time we thought was terrible, but obviously works quite well for the ending, so every cloud. That moment was great because the door sort of opens and Diego doesn't come out and then someone else comes out and then Diego comes out and then when he comes out, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. you, also, it was just tense whether he was actually going to come out or not. I remember we just sort of watching. And he's brilliant with them as well. I mean, people, Woody has a moment here where he says, people say he's not all right, but he's all right. You know, he's all right. And he was just so lovely with them. I think people often say, what would have happened if, you had, if he had invited you in for lunch or whatever? I think that wouldn't have been nearly as good. I think the idea is just this angel touching their lives for a moment and sort of then just going off to Peru. And it's, it's just a beautiful moment. Mikey was so funny here because he gets, he meets him first 
And then now, obviously, Diego signs Sammy Shaw, and then he signs Woody. By the time he gets to Woody, Mikey's come all the way around the other side and he's back to see him again. I mean, just to explain, I, I think the film shows it, but this is one of the hardest things you can ever do is meet this man. He just doesn't turn up. You can pay him five million quid and he won't turn up to a charity event. He's literally so difficult to get hold of, and here he is meeting these three boys. I mean, Camilla, the, the, the girl who sort of Mikey befriended and brought along with, you know, she spent her whole life in Buenos Aires, and this was also her finest moment of her life where she meets her hero, Diego, as well. And it's like that sort of showed us how hard this whole thing was. Hey, look at Mikey and Sammy there. That's just lovely, isn't it? <laughs> But, you know, she met these three boys and got sort of swept up with it and now is here meeting him. It's just an amazing moment, really. Can I kiss you? I was fuming at the end of the ride because uh, they wouldn't... They only they, they basically only wanted the cameraman there because um, the guy who called Mikey said, like, you know, we don't want to do a big deal. Diego wants to meet you, but he doesn't want the whole thing. So only the cameraman can come through. So uh, the rest of us, me, Ben and Ben, uh, stood at the end of the road and we didn't get to meet Maradona. Mm. People always ask, did you meet him? Well, how was he a nice bloke? I have no idea. I was stood at the end of the road fuming because uh, we couldn't get to meet him ourselves. And then fleeting goodbye, my friends, I'm off to Peru. I mean, what a great line to leave. You know, you've just chased across the world to meet this guy. And he goes, see you later, I'm off to Peru. It's just an amazing moment. I don't think we could have ever... I mean, I think when we first saw it, we were a bit upset that they were all asking for autographs and getting photos, because I think, you know, we just hoped that they'd say something more special to him rather than say, can I have your autograph? But actually, it is, it is what you do, and it breaks the ice, really, doesn't it? It's just one of those moments where, uh, what else do you do? You know, it's great as well. Sammy's T-shirt's got five stars. It's a Nike T-shirt to commemorate all the World Cups that Brazil have won. <laughs> and, and that's what he's what got a... Diego's autograph on. I'm actually in this scene as well. This is my starry moment. It's not, it's not a hug. It's not a hug. It's not a hug, but at least I'm in it. Is this intentional? Did you well, that intentional. I'm in the back? It's not intentional. intentional. Uh, the boys, when we got back to the edit, so here I am, they're walking in the background. There I go, and off I go. Why didn't you but, just walk behind camera? Because <clears throat> they were up against the wall. I Why promise you. Wait? you I couldn't wait. I had to get around the other side of the camera. To do what? Listen, this is the best moment of the film, and we're talking about my appearance. I mean, what? You're talking about your you appearance. Out, I'm okay. upset by it. It ruins it for me. OK. Sorry that I... Look, you see, up against the wall. See that wall? Couldn't walk around it. <laughs> Mikey, Sammy, Woody, Jeremy, Danny. Almost famous. It sort of sums up Mikey, really. Mikey Where he is much hates bigger that T-shirt. Yeah. Coming he, in at that point, I always Where did we thinking... find that T-shirt? He, no, he, he, he made, made it, it and he, just brought it out there. But I remember when I watched, when I watched, when every time I watch it through in the cinema, I always think to myself, please don't be reading that T-shirt. You know, please don't notice that he's come up with a T-shirt saying almost famous on it. And it also says In Search of Diego on the front, which yeah. is, of course, the old title of the film. And this is great. I mean, we filmed, we shot Sammy going home to his mum. When we, got, we, when we were on our way back to England, we realised that the story wasn't going to be complete until we saw him going home to see his mum. So... After this unbelievable odyssey and completely exhausted, we then went up to shoot the next day with Sammy. But we didn't need it in the end because I think this is a really strong moment. Mm. I think the one thing, that, I mean, the next scene coming up is, is a fantastic scene because obviously everyone has forgotten in truth about Danny and Jeremy in the same way that maybe the three boys had a little bit. I think the audience have as well. I think there's that guilty feeling that they think, oh, my God, I totally forgot about Danny and Jeremy. And there's always in cinemas this gasp when Danny and Jeremy walk out. And I think that's partly what we wanted to do, which is why you haven't seen them for 15, 20 minutes, because we sort of wanted you to forget about them. But um, the other thing that people always say, which I think is quite frustrating, is, oh, that, that scene obviously must be fake. There's no way they could have discovered it on the TV. But they, you know, you were with them, but yeah. you were filming that bit. Oh, they did. They walked out in the airport, and it was it was lucky in a way that we had used that journalist camera because the moment they arrived, they went into a restaurant to have to start eating their um, breakfast, and there were the boys on the TV wow. behind them. It was an unbelievable way to end the film, really. Look at them all pride as punch. I felt it's it's a really sad moment in a way, and it's a terrible way to find out. But that was the way it happened. Yeah. There it is. <clears throat> There's also always arguments over Danny's smile there at the end about whether it's a, whether it's a, I'm pleased for you or it's a you, you yeah. I'll wait till I get my hands on you smile. But it's um, we will uh, well we've all got our opinions, but we'll leave that to the exactly we'll leave, leave that. it to the audience. I think he was probably pleased for them. <laughs> Sammy was very sweet on the show actually when he went on there. We were Tim, it was quite difficult to cut that with Sammy saying you know what what happened on the trip and mm. what he'd been through. And there's the picture. There is a picture. It's on my wall by my bed. I never nice. thought I'd have a picture, picture of Mikey Fisher by my bed, but I do. And this is uh, all our crew going through. Our co-producer here, Rebecca Green, who's worked with us and 
and our execs, Gary Senor, who uh, believed in the project from day one. We went to him really early doors, Gary, of, uh, and uh, he said, I, I love this idea, it would be a great idea for a film. And he backed us and uh, yeah. took us to the UK Film Council, who supported this film as well. And there's the boys, coming down, Mikey Fisher. Speak often Rodriguez, also Giuliano, who are our main three cameramen. Yeah. It's a fantastic job for us. And Cassie, we've mentioned Will and Richard, and they helped us shoot the pilot, and the other two with some extra footage. And there's Sound Benjamin men. Turner's name again. Under the editors, yeah. It's, it's an editor's credit as well, much deserved. An unbelievable soundtrack with James Hyman. Um, and, of course, Mary and Debbie, and Miranda Jones, who's just been tremendous throughout this whole process yeah. with our post-production. I don't think we could have existed without her. Matthew Rosaic, a.k.a. The Prosaic. Exactly. Provider of original music. Jordan Bergman, the man responsible for a catch-up and muster fight in New York with Leon. Dewsbury and Rusty, which we spoke about. And, of course, Alexander, Paul and Mateus Roth, who in Zebra Films, who helped us try and get a release form from Diego Maradona for that final push, which is a whole other story about how we actually managed to get the release form for that. Kai, Kai The Beers. Exactly. Who graded it? Anthony Stadler, International Man of Mystery. <laughs> exactly. The we, des we decided to dedicate this film. It says France and David Gillian and Sam and Lear and Robert. Those are our um, three sets of parents. Yeah. We have two brothers here, so there's no four sets of parents. Yeah. And we could all choose one person to dedicate films. I chose Tony Adams. I chose Kevin Ball, top right. My hero, Tony Adams. Niall Quinn's also there, and oh, Roy Keane. And of course, Diego Maradona. Well, we've enjoyed chatting about pretty much nothing for uh, an hour and 45 minutes. I, uh, if you've sat through it, commend you greatly. And uh, from us all, farewell. Take care. Thank you for supporting the film and enjoying it. I hope. <laughs> Nothing you used to, them kind of stylish shopping schools too. My and soul in tune and